turned over to the public defender's office. So meeting is back in order. We have a quorum of eight here before us. We're going to go ahead and start with trespass on our agenda item. We are late for the day, but I think we'll be able to be done at a reasonable hour, and that is the goal. We've accomplished a lot this morning. So members of the public who, who hope to testify to us, we've had a, a busy day today. So if you look glazed over, we're not. We're still listening. Just give us a break a little bit. So with that, um, LSO topic introduction of Wyoming's law on trespass. Attorney Racines. Madam Chairman, uh, priority number seven for management council is a review of trespass law. Uh, the committee will receive reports and recommendations from stakeholders regarding Wyoming's law on trespass. Uh, the committee has given a uh, topic summary, um, should be in your materials. Um, generally, trespass on private property is currently enforceable through both criminal and civil actions. Uh, the general criminal statutes, uh, general criminal trespass under 63303 um, has essentially elements that require a person enter or remain on pr private property of another either when he knows he is not authorized to enter or remain or after being notified to depart or not trespass. Um, the essential difference between general criminal trespass and uh, two others in the statutes, uh, a game and fish trespass and um, data trespass or trespass to collect resource data is in the uh, knowledge or science or element. Um, in the game and fish trespass and the criminal uh, data trespass, knowing that you are trespassing or on private property without permission is not an element of those two offenses. The distinction there is uh, the trespasser has to be on the land for a specific purpose in um, hunting, in fish trespass, either to hunt fish, collect horns, etc. And the criminal uh, data trespass uh, is the purpose of being on the private land is to collect resource data. Um, un unrelated to, I think, the topic uh, before you, um, a, a section of that criminal uh, data trespass, as well as the accompanying civil data trespass, was found unconstitutional. Um, that was just relating to tr passing through private property to get to public property for that purpose that was uh, deemed unconstitutional on its face by uh, the Tenth Circuit um, a couple of years ago. At, uh, in the civil law, uh, there is both statutory and common law uh, trespass. Uh, the common law boils down to uh, a plaintiff, in other words, the person who is doing the suing or the landowner generally, is in possession of a property and the defendant intentionally entered on the property without authorization. A couple of things that are important to note here is, of course, civil cases um, are uh, private actions between um, citizens as opposed to criminal cases, which uh, the plaintiff essentially is the state of Wyoming, charged by a prosecutor and has criminal penalties such as jail or fines. Civil actions are uh, between private persons and they seek generally monetary damages um, and sometimes equitable relief. But um, common law civil trespass is enforceable um, with money damages, damage to the land, cost of restoration of any damage, the loss of use, um, discomfort and annoyance that it causes. Um, civil law, common law trespass also is, um, has a nominal damage option uh, the jury could award the plaintiff if none of those actual damages are uh, incurred, a nominal uh, fee, as well as uh, punitive damages. A plaintiff can recover punitive damages if 
the defendant's conduct was committed in reckless disregard or willful indifference to the plaintiff's rights to the land. Mr. Racinus? Yes. Some folks in the back are um, stating that they can't hear you very well. Sorry. I'll try to be a little closer. Thank you to the mic. Um, the, uh, I've pointed out a couple of statutory civil actions, um, most notably uh, the civil data trespass in Title 40. Um, this essentially uh, mirrors uh, the criminal data trespass. Uh, what's different about this is in addition to the ordinary damages, um, a plaintiff couldn't can recover uh, litigation costs, attorney's fees, um, expert witness fees, and any uh, costs that are incurred to recover um, the judgment. Generally, uh, generally speaking, trespass laws, our, our trespass law is modeled on the model penal code, um, and with the exception of the fencing option that the model penal code has um, the general trespass statute um, follows the model penal code with regard to um, knowing the defendant knows he is not authorized to do so or um, after he is notified that he is trespassing and, and needs to depart um, and I should be clear on that Notice is given under our statute by personal communication uh, by the owner or occupant, law enforcement, or an agent of the owner or the occupant, or by posting signs that are reasonably likely to come to the attention of intruders. Um, the model penal code also has, which we do not have, um, uh, the option of fencing that's uh, likely to put the trespasser on notice that there are uh, private property. So that, that's a general, very quick overview um, of existing Wyoming trespass law. Happy to try to answer any questions that the committee might have. <coughs> questions from the committee? All right, with that, we will turn to the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. Mr. Magagna. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Jim McGagna with the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. Just very briefly, Madam Chair, we we come to the recognize the need to address this issue for a couple of reasons. The criminal trespass statute was last amended, I believe, in in the mid 1980s, and a couple of things have changed of significance since then. First, the ability of an individual to determine. Uh, whether or not they are on private land has been enhanced by technology with the use of GPS and by just better mapping that maps are now available that uh, more clearly identify those private lands and, and raise that issue. The second thing that I believe has happened more nebulously, but that is that as much of Wyoming in particular has become more popular for people for outdoor recreation use and that, and particularly people who are not native to this area and don't understand land ownership patterns, it, it's very easy for people to assume that so many of these wide open spaces are just public lands that are available to be uh, utilized as a person would choose to do so. So with those two factors in mind, uh, we along with the other agricultural groups have been looking at a meaningful way to uh, bring some amendment to the criminal trespass statute uh, to still recognize that the system isn't perfect, mistakes can be made, innocent mistakes, but that nevertheless it's, uh, it's important to put a little greater burden on parties to determine where they are. So the proposed uh, legislative change that we bring to you today that we will receive the copy of uh, does two things. It removes uh, the requirement that a person know they're not authorized to be on the land, which currently can only be accomplished through uh, posting or through telling them to stay off of the land, removes that and uh, 
places an affirmative requirement on them to determine if they're properly on a piece of land. But then at the same time, uh, we've provided some affirmative defenses recognizing that, that there's not always complete certainty. So <laughs> a, a defense to being on private land without being, uh, having authorization to do so would be that a party use the GPS system in a reasonable manner, that they had looked at a land status map, which indicated to them that they were in a location that was not uh, private land, or that they were directed by a landowner or a immediate contiguous landowner that this was a place that they were authorized to be. Those would be their defenses against an act of trespass. The other thing we also did at the same time, uh, Mr. Racine has mentioned uh, the game and fish trespass laws, which is something that was done some 10, 15 years ago. Under that law, uh, trespassing to hunt or fish where the activity takes place on the private land and trespass is a misdemeanor subject to up to six months imprisonment and a thousand dollar fine. The general trespass law currently in statute the fine is $750, and we're proposing to standardize that at $1,000 across the board. Um, other ideas that we discussed and did not go that far uh, is to look at the civil trespass and certainly the language that's in the civil trespass for data collection that was passed about four years ago. Uh, could be used, I believe, to enhance the penalties and the opportunity for recovery for civil trespass. But we felt at this point in time that the, the main objective that we have is to make it more meaningful, more attractive, if I might say, for county prosecutors to prosecute some of these uh, trespass offenses under the criminal statute by removing that burden that, that the party has to have been told or the land has to be posted. And in particularly in Western Wyoming, a lot of these private parcels are not separately fenced. Uh, it's not in the public's interest that we encourage people to have to fence them to protect their private property rights because of movement of wildlife and general uh, recreational use. So we feel this is a way to uh, put some of that burden on people in a positive way and yet recognize that the system will not be perfect. With that, Madam Chair, I would be happy to take any questions or defer to others who testify on this. Thank you, Mr. McGagna. Any questions for Mr. McGagna? Senator Anselmi Dalton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. McGagna, I'm just curious how often this is occurring where these people are really, I mean, what we just did the public defender's office where if we put them in imprisonment, I mean, is it really, are we having criminal trespass where it's really awful and is imprisonment really appropriate or should it just be a fine? I mean, would that just take care of it here? We go down this bunny hole again. Mr. McGagna. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Anselmi Dalton, uh, if I can distinguish that from the reports I get from many of our members, the incident of trespass is becoming more widespread all the time. It's very widespread. Uh, the prosecution under the criminal statute tends to vary fairly widely from one county to another. Uh, some county prosecutors based on any number of factors perhaps on their workload perhaps on how this particular crime is viewed in the county are somewhat more aggressive in in prosecuting uh these cases uh others are are not and and part of the problem under the current statute is that um if, if i as a user out on the land i'm told to stay off if i'm reasonably respected i'm going i'm going to follow that or if I clearly see a sign that makes it obvious that if I cross this fence line, I'm on private property, I'm going to be respectful of, of that. Uh, and the people who don't make any effort to determine whether they're not they're on private property are the ones that are not being prosecuted today because of the requirement of prior notice. Mr. McGagna. I think one thing that might be helpful for the committee and, and the public in general is to understand why this legislation is so important, particularly to the stock growers or to these landowners. Is it more than just someone coming on their land, which is certainly um, a crime to come on there un unwelcomed, but is there more happening? Is there concern about damage to the land or, or can you speak to that at all about what is happening and what 
what damage it, it is causing, if any? Certainly, Madam Chair, and, and a couple of things. Certainly, there's in certain instances, there can be significant physical damage, uh, particularly if they're going off of an established road with an off-road vehicle in the mud or that. There's damage to the resource. Uh, sometimes there's even intentional damage of cutting down trees for one purpose or another, things like that. But the other damage that, that we often hear about is that there are livestock out on those lands and just the disturbance if they're cattle out grazing and, or sheep out grazing and uh, a trespasser causes those animals to bunch up and move across the land. It has both a negative impact on the animal itself in terms of its well-being, but also a, a corresponding negative impact on the resource because of that forced trailing across the land. Thank you. Senator Bonner? And Madam Chairman, just, just to expand on that a little bit, I guess I don't have a question, but you know, just um, using personal experience, especially as a sheep herder, if you disturb, <clears throat> say, a, a, a young sheep, a lamb with its mother, and the mother runs off, the lamb could very well die, it'll, it'll lose its mother, and it's not going to uh, survive very long if it's, a, if it's a brand new lamb. So that's something that I think sheep herders are especially worried about um, as a farmer. Uh, we, we have, it seems like it's uh, also anecdotal, but just have people driving off the highway saying, you know, right past those no trespassing signs, act as if they don't see it, just blatantly asking to hunt without any prior authorization, uh, driving, they don't know where to go on our property. And so what uh, Mr. McGagnon said with the damages to the land itself, which you depend on for your living, those can be significant. So there are economic damages, both in terms of livestock and uh, um, and uh, the land itself, in addition to being on a river, um, I think that's the value I see in this is that there's, you get a different type of trespass and that that area of the land is not as uh, heavily used. Um, and so you get people coming up from the river taking all sorts of, you know, we have a pretty decent patch of asparagus in our case, you know, we, um, folks who are interested in those sorts of things. And that sort of activity is not as obvious because it's not coming from a, uh, a major roadway it's coming on the river so uh obviously we're most people aren't going to post no trespassing signs every you know 50 feet upon uh, on the river like they would uh, on a roadway so uh, hopefully that helps the committee uh, just share that anecdotal experience to maybe give flesh out a little bit what mr mcgagnon was saying and it's something i have no actual proof but anecdotally seems to be getting a little bit worse thank you senator boner co-chairman kirkbride thank you madam chairman Mr. McGagna, I've heard reports uh, with the increased mineral activity out east of Cheyenne that quite a bit of trespassing, uh, or some trespassing at least, related to that. Are you hearing those reports from your members? Madam Chair, uh, Co-Chair Kirk Wright, yes, I am hearing some of that as well, particularly from, you know, obviously once there's a mineral lease in place, then there are certain rights to be on the land that accompany that, but uh, particularly from... Um, landmen who are just out looking for opportunities perhaps or seismic crews that uh, are out doing seismic work and they may have authorization based on a mineral lease to be on one piece of land but then they uh, without concern maybe move on to an adjacent piece of land that is not been leased that they don't have authority i've heard those examples certainly in southeastern wyoming and in the uh, uh, converse county uh, campbell county area in the past as well any additional questions, Representative Washington? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. McGagna, I am sympathetic to the situation, um, but I am still a little concerned that not everyone has GPS capabilities or uh, map apps on their phones and so forth. You know, we still live in a state with a fair amount of population that's a little less technologically inclined. Um, so that's my one concern with what you're suggesting because I know a fair number of people with hair as gray as mine who don't uh, uh, use technology the way that, uh, so maybe we're a little premature. Your thoughts? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Walsh, uh, I, I understand that point. I, and I think by this giving warning to people that that's going to be their defense, uh, doesn't mean they all need to go out and purchase a GPS unit. Uh, but, you know, mapping is fairly basic. I think it will cause most people, unless they know the land well, and many of the people that 
you're talking about, I think, are Wyoming people, and they know land ownership patterns well. But for the public in general, this will cause them to to move in the direction of becoming better informed, whether it's just getting a plain paper map to read or whether it's uh, knocking on someone's I mean, door and seeking permission. This, this can also drive them toward seeking permission rather than just going out and hoping that uh, they aren't caught. So um, the breadth of tools that's available, I believe, is broad enough to address the valid issue that you've raised. Representative Salazar. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, just a comment. I, I support this legislation. I think it should go forward. Um, I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you. Any additional questions for Mr. McGagna? Senator Koff. I also support the legislation, but the one question I was wondering about was, would it be possible for a tiered uh, fine system to eliminate that first offenses requiring uh, judicial to have uh, different requirements for who's in charge of uh, representing them, such as a county attorney or whatever, um, just to try to ease some of the court burdens that they're also facing at the same time. Um, I know a lot of areas, especially up in our area, the BLM land and the private land run together so much, it's pretty easy to end up thinking you're on BLM and finding out you're on private land at the same time. So some of those things could enter into that first offense and then the second offense possibly. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were there. Mr. McGagney. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Cost, a, a couple of thoughts I guess I would have there is one, because this is a criminal statute, it's going to necessarily involve uh, a prosecution uh, for a misdemeanor. So I don't know that changing the penalty would would change that an awful lot. The other thing that I think realistically and knowing most of the ranching community, uh, you know, a, a landowner, a property owner, particularly an agricultural property owner, is not out there just looking for ways to to bring a lot, to get a lot of these suits brought. I mean, they gain nothing out of a prosecution other than maybe discouraging future trespass. There's, there's no monetary return to them under the criminal statute. So I would see that you know, in a lot of cases, a landowner approaches someone, they haven't done any damage, They're, they've just gotten over and, and they have a positive conversation and say, you know, gee, I, I apologize, I thought I was in the right place, I won't do it again, but that's going to be the end of the case. So I, uh, I think honestly, we do need more prosecutions than we've had in the past, but I don't see this at this point as leading to a, a massive number of new prosecutions. Representative Stitt. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Mr. McGagna, thank you for the presentation. Can you walk me through an example of how this proposed legislation would work? Imagine you're in a county that has a checkerboard pattern of land ownership. It's hunting season. Someone's in a lawful hunting area. You have two public sections uh, that are diagonal to each, that are that only the corners touch, but, and the other two sections are private. It sounds like if we take out the, the uh, knowledge requirement Essentially, what it means is if, you, if you're a hunter and you step from one public section to the next public section and you cross the corner, you go to jail for six months. Is that how this plays out? <coughs> Madam Mr. Chair and, and Representative <laughs> Stith, well, uh, first of all, if you're actually, the hunting takes place, if you harvest an animal on the private land, uh, that's already covered under the game fish statute. So that one wouldn't. This wouldn't have any applicability there because that's already illegal and the fines are the same amount and everything under current game and fish statute. Uh, the area where it could come into play is if you trespass on a piece of private land to then hunt on the, and the actual hunt takes place on public land, uh, this could come into play. Now, uh, obviously, the checkerboard is a rather unique situation, fortunately, and most of it in county that you and I come from uh, is kept open to the public for hunting and that. So it's it's hasn't really been an issue there. But in some other areas, it, it can be an issue. And uh, it, it certainly has not been practical in the checkerboard to post every one of those sections in a, to an adequate manner uh, to make the current criminal statute applicable. So that's an area that to the extent that something is needed and that there needs to be a prosecution, 
that it require, would require these changes in order to make that possible. Representative Smith, follow up. Uh, Madam Chairman, so I guess the answer is yes. You cross a corner, even if you step from one public section to another public section, but in doing so, cross this corner on the checkerboard and the other two sections are private, uh, that's a crime. Madam Chair, Representative Stith, you know, that's, I'm, I'm not going to try and provide a total answer there. There's been uh, litigation over that issue, and I believe Mr. Racinas provided members of the committee with a copy of that particular uh, lawsuit, which in that case, at least, the court determined that stepping over that corner did not constitute trespass. Uh, I think that's probably a decision that may end up in front of a court again in the future, and whether the answer is always the same, I not going to predict. Thank you. Any additional questions for Mr. McGaga? Thank you, Mr. McGaga. Mr. Thank Mulvey. you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, Madam Chair, Brett Moline, Wyoming Farm Bureau Federation, standing in support of this change to our current statutes. In visiting with my members statewide, trespassing is becoming a larger issue. It, it's, it's not just in one area of the state, it's not just in the checkerboard, it's, it's throughout the state. And without being redundant, I agree with everything that uh, Mr. McGagna said. Uh, we've worked together on this, this potential change to the legislation. And what I want to point out is I think the biggest thing this does is it strengthens private property. You know, not not just for ranchers, but I think uh, other people that are living out in the rural area, this strengthens their private property rights. And with that, standing firmly behind this, supporting it, is one of my organization's major goals is to protect private property rights. I think this helps us. Is this going to be a savior for every situation? No. What we have now isn't. Um, I think it's a step, a great step in the correct direction. With that, Madam Chair, I would sit for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Moline. Questions for Mr. Moline? All right. Thank, thank you, you, committee. All right. We have Scott Edberg, Deputy Chief, Game Warden, Miami Game of Fish. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members. Scott Edberg, Deputy Chief, Game Warden, Miami Game of Fish Department. Um, Based on what I've heard today, it sounds like a lot of the discussions or the actual uh, uh, issue before the committee is more about criminal trespass and game and fish trespass. But uh, I would sure be uh, open to questions or clarification on with regards to the game and fish trespass or the corner crossing uh, issue that came up as it pertains to hunting and the attorney general's opinion that uh, outlines that uh, issue and how that may or may not be prosecuted or may or may not be a criminal offense. Mr. Edberg, do you see an increase in trespassing as it relates to game and fish issues? Uh, Madam Chair, over my 29-year career uh, as enforcement, uh, trespass has been one of our top violations. It's fairly consistent. Um, it's uh, usually in areas where there's significant private land, where hunters are don't have did not gain access to hunt ahead of time, and so they're kind of forced into hunting small parcels of private land and don't have the maps or the GPS or the knowledge or whatever it may be to know where they're at. A lot of it's not intentional, but uh, you know, we're getting about uh, you know 700 plus citations a year and 500 plus warnings a year, uh, I believe, for, for uh, game of fish trespass. Representative Funnell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I didn't catch your name again. Scott Edberg. Edward? Edberg. Edberg. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is, uh, kind of refresh my memory here, uh, at one point uh, Game and Fish was able to issue citations on on uh, the criminal trespass, and I think there was some other, uh, whatever the Attorney General's opinion was, but would you kind of tell me what, what happened where a lot of the Sheriff's offices had to step in and, and issue citations instead of the game warden? So, and, and if that needs to be uh, rectified or something done, I'd sure like to know. Absolutely. Mr. Edward. Madam Chair, Representative Powell, um, do our peace officer status, which is defined in statute, we can only define, we can only enforce Title 23, Chapter Title 41, Chapter 13, which is watercraft, 
and a handful of other statutes. And as that, we are not uh, allowed by law to enforce criminal trespass, and we never have enforced criminal trespass. We can only do <coughs> fish trespass. Representative Pelkey. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, just as a refresher, what is the uh, penalty for game and fish trespass? Game and fish trespass, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Resident, Representative Pelkey, the uh, violation for um, criminal trespass or game and fish trespass is up to $1,000 fine, six months imprisonment, and up to three years of license suspension privileges. Additionally, uh, based on the uh, circumstances of the offense, we have the ability to must appear a defendant, and at which time uh, other uh, penalties may be imposed. Also, we have the ability to seize any unlawfully taken wildlife. Uh, clarification is most of the times when we write a citation for game and fish trespass, it's called a bondable offense, in which there's a set bond by the, US Supreme, or by the Wyoming Supreme Court uh, that a person can pay versus going to court uh, and that takes care of the of that citation so that's currently a four hundred and twenty dollar bondable offense so many many times whether you're resident or non-residents are people that are issued citations for trespass just go pay the four hundred and twenty dollar bond and i'm assuming that the criminal trespass would, is also a bondable offense um, that a person could do versus actually going to court and seeing a judge and being <clears throat> sentenced the maximum penalties both in money and imprisonment Thank you, Mr. Edberg. For the committee's um, information, if you look at page two of the LSO memo, it provides the, the, the key trespass laws that we're talking about, and behind the memo are all those statutes as well. So, Senator Von Flater. Thank you, Mr. Ed, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Edberg, you probably don't know what um, how many people they put in jail for criminal trespass, but do you know how many people you've ever put in jail for game violation mm -hmm. trespassing? Madam Chair, Senator Von Plater, in my career and and my understanding of, you know, across my 29 year career is that most people go to jail, uh, not for criminal trespass or game and fish trespass, excuse me, but associated uh, wildlife violations, which may include game and fish trespass. But we very, very rarely imprison somebody for uh, uh, game and fish trespass. There was just a recent case in the western part of the state where an individual was uh, shed, hand, shed uh, antler hunting out of a close season. It's not really trespass, but he did get uh, sentenced to 10 days, but there's a whole lot of additional circumstances that went along with that. So there are some instances where people will get in prison for game and fish offenses. Additional questions for Mr. Edberg? All right, Mr. Edberg, for thank me. you. Oh, Co-Chairman Kirkbride. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Edberg, walk me through a situation where somebody gets the goods on somebody for trespass. Is it you find them on your land, uh, with the animal, do you take a picture of him? I mean, I think there's only one game warden in my county, so he probably can't get down there in time to see them, literally, in the act. So uh, how, how does somebody prove that there's trespass? Okay, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Vice Chair Kirkbride, this is, I'll just go through a scenario how this, how a trespass goes. So usually we get a call from the landowner or his agent uh, that's dispatched to one of our enforcement, usually the local game warden responds, Many times the landowner is actually in contact with the trespasser um, through cell phones and stuff. We usually call those people and say, we're on our way, where are you at, get the details. Um, maybe the hunter will say, I'm out of here. You know, those, our landowners, the partnership we have with our landowners, they collect the information that's needed, phys uh, description of vehicles, description of the individuals. We'll go to the scene, we'll physically do an investigation, including documenting the exact legal location of where the trespass occurred. Uh, if the Defendants are there or the trespassers are there. We ask if the landowner is willing to press trespass charges. Uh, we will do not write a trespass ticket unless the landowner is willing to sign as the complainant, willing to press the charges. Um, if that happens, we will then uh, issue a citation uh, to the individual and then the, the judicial process takes over after that. But, you know, it's an, an investigation like we do with any other case. We gather the facts um, in many cases. Um, or there may be maybe some gray area and stuff like that will present those facts to the county attorney's office and then they will make the ultimate decision if they're going to move on with the actual prosecution of a, of a game of fish trespass. All right, thank you, Mr. Edberg. Anyone else? 
All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other agencies that would like to come forward and testify as to this topic? Any public comment? Mr. Barron, I'm going to invite you up again. My name is Joe Barron. I'm here on behalf of the Crook County Attorney's Office, and uh, I'll make this very clear. I only represent the Crook County Attorney. The County Attorney's Offices uh, want to see what's going on with this bill, um, and there's a mixture of uh, things about that. The I was handed a copy of the proposed bill that uh, was brought to you. Uh, Any time that you can remove intent and make it almost a strict liability citation, like a speeding ticket, you did it. Um, it makes my job easier to prosecute that case. Uh, given that fact, uh, I'd like you, if, when you, if you develop the statute, to develop it, if you go back one statute, 63302, uh, three, it's a, uh, and that's criminal entry statute. But my point in on that statute is this, is they have a list of affirmative defenses on that. And so you do this, and then you list your affirmative defenses, and in that proposed legislation, there's affirmative defenses in there, and they need to be listed in there uh, so that we know uh, what they are. And that then, it's up to the defendant then to uh, bring those sort of things forward as far as the defense goes, if they have, uh, you know, any of the issues that uh, were raised in there. So if there's any any uh, affirmative defenses, that would be a good place to list them. I think that uh, if the bill goes forward on this, that that list will be developed at your next hearing on that because there will be people that want to have input on that thing and not just the GPS thing, things like that. Uh, so that's... Uh, um, something that could happen. One of the things that was a question I heard down here that was raised was, um, I, I think that the Wyoming Supreme Court could make this the criminal trespass, not the game and fish trespass, because it's already a vulnerable offense. I don't think there's anything that prohibits the Wyoming Supreme Court from making that a, uh, a vulnerable offense uh, on that. That's a possibility that may exist there. Uh, it may I don't, I don't think it requires a legislature to determine whether it's vulnerable. I think it's up to the court. The, the other thing um, on that, because there's, there's, there's other things that come up as far as prosecuting these cases. In my mind, you know, you crawl across the fence, that's notice that you probably ought not be there. There's a reason for that fence. However, I will tell you, judges and juries don't always agree with that. And so if you're going to put notice provision in there, like a fence, but as we live in Wyoming, we know this, there's not a fence in this state that's on the line. And um, that's just the way, and if you're in Crook County, it's worse. I, I personal experience, it's, that's just, and, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is because back when most of these fences were put in place, the things, fences were more valuable than the land. And um, they, they just put them there because it's a convenient place, because you want the fences to stand up instead of the snow to uh, knock it over or whatever. Uh, so you wanted a place to keep cows in, and uh, and it serves a purpose. Uh, it's not necessarily always a barrier between the, your castle and the next castle. So, yeah, I'll stand for any questions. If anybody has any questions. About questions for Mr. Barron. You know, Mr. Barron, one issue that we brought forward that we struggled with, and you answered it right off the bat, which is these aren't being prosecuted, and there's a real frustration with the county attorneys across the state of, of not seeing, seeming to be responsive to the needs of landowners and are prosecuting these. Can you provide maybe just some general understanding as to why a prosecutor would be hesitant to, to move forward based as the law is currently written? Madam Chairman, the... These, these cases, there's a lot of things that are out there. Uh, sometimes people that they have these, they want to use the trespass laws, and they want to use um, the sheriff enforcing trespass laws to beat up on their neighbors. There's an ulterior motive on some of these things because the fence isn't online, 
or something like that. And so you have competing interests in that case. You have the legal owner of the land, and that's who pays taxes on the land. Then you got the adjoining landowner that has an equitable right to use that property because it's been fenced into their pasture for the last hundred years. And so when somebody wants to go put it back on, they, you know, one of the call, well, let's, they're on our property. And that's a civil adverse possession case that's there. So sometimes that's the case. The other thing is, is just the, just the fact, like um, the Game and Fish indicated, these cases have to be in, investigated just like real cases. Uh, they are real cases. And that means you've got to go out and take statements from people. people. The Game and Fish does an excellent job with these cases because they go out with their GPS and they find shell casings where people were. They find blood that's out there where somebody was from a deer or something like that. And so those cases get put together. And then they write a ticket to them, and it's usually a bondable citation that people just pay, and it's done. In a criminal case, the sheriff does that, and it's, a, it's on a scale. He has a lot of other things to do besides deal with this particular a trespass case. So that's a, that's a case of investigation. Many of these cases that get reported don't reach to that level of actually getting criminally prosecuted because they don't get there because the sheriff and talking to the individuals don't want to prosecute it because they don't want to make the neighbor mad or they, they don't have enough evidence, frankly, to prosecute the case. Somebody's out there, you got to find out who it was, and then you got to find where it is. And frankly, many landowners don't actually know where their property's at. Um, and that, uh, we've run into all of those situations over the years. And, and we do prosecute cases. We just had one we prosecuted, uh, and there was a damage case. Young uh, men went out and they proceeded to, you know, run up a guy's pasture pretty bad. Uh, we prosecuted him for trespass on that. And then he made restitution. They agreed to $1,000 for restitution in the matter with the landowner. So th those things do get done. But many times law enforcement goes out, they talk to the landowner, they just don't want these people back, they go talk to them, that's it. So I can't tell you um, the reasons in a particular case, I can just tell you what's in general. Thank you. Representative Washett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Barron, we've been talking about this uh, proposed statute more in terms of rural uh, agricultural properties and hunting situations. I'd like you to think about in terms of a small town or a city in a more urban setting um, where sometimes people are being 86 from businesses or other locations. Can you see anything in this proposed statute that might become problematic in a non-agricultural setting? Madam Chairman, uh, Representative Washington, I, I believe that's the, how this law needs to be developed when you come to the affirmative defenses. Because you, in, a, in that setting, you have business invitees that you open your doors, you want people to come in. Uh, the way that gets handled is, is to uh, essentially, if somebody wants somebody removed, they contact law enforcement generally, and they tell them, you need to get out. The classic is the bar owner, 86 of somebody, tells them to get out. If they don't get out, they can call the sheriff who either tells them to, to the PD or whoever's there, and they can either arrest them. Have you told them to get out? Yes, they have. Then that's enough. I mean, they've get, given notice to remove themselves from the premises, and they uh, failed to refuse to do that in some fashion. So it, this thing here, if you're... Um, the, the knowledge of the notice, that would be something I would think that you would you could put in um, to do that. That also could be maybe set over into like the, I'd have to look at it, but the criminal entry, uh, uh, which is, the, that's different. That would work. But something like that, you, you would, I, I would think that you would set that out in an affirmative defense uh, type situation. You, got, you have to have some notice. Thank you. Representative Ponell. Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Barons, what uh, another, my question is, I guess, on the, some of the defense that they use now, and the reason they don't prosecute is they claim that they, they didn't see the no trespass sign. It's a small, they never even noticed it on the, 
on the auto gate as they went by. Is that an, I mean, because I've heard that where they, they didn't see that sign, so I didn't know I was on private property. Because there's several, I mean, obviously as a defense, they've got several options. Mr. Barron. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Representative Pennell, uh, people have all kinds of stories. <laughs> I mean, they really do. Um, I've had folks, the landowners told them, there's a sign here. This is not a county road anymore. They have a copy, laminated copy of the order from the Board of County Commissioners saying, this is not a county road, this is private property. And they still go past it because they're on their little GPS and it says they can't. Even though when they buy that off the Game and Fish website, it says right there, check with the local landowners and check with everybody here because this may not be totally accurate. Believe me, I've heard it all. We still prosecute it, but it's it, it that it, deputies that are out there, uh, they've heard it all too. Uh, they're going to bring that case and they'll probably cite them. Especially if they, they drive in and they see the sign too. They'll take a picture for me and go and went past the sign. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Byrne, thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Odekoven, coming forward. Welcome, Mr. Odekoven. Good to see you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You have a guest. Thank you. Byron Odekoven, the Executive for the Director for the Wyoming Sheriffs and Chiefs. I also have Sharon, Sheriff Alan Thompson from Sheridan County joining me today for the discussion. Let me cup, touch on a couple of points. Uh, that were raised and help, hopefully help clarify a couple of the pieces. One of the, the issue we have before us is trespass. And the question we have is why aren't people being prosecuted? And of course, part of that discussion is centers around the existing statute. Somebody has to tell them you aren't supposed to be in the middle of that pasture doing whatever it is you're doing that you think it's okay to do in some manner, whether it's a notice uh, of a sign or by the landowner or by law enforcement. So by default, and as we've, as we've bantered about the issue, we title that the first offense is pretty much free. You get to be told you aren't supposed to be out there doing whatever it is you're doing. And if you come back and do it, we'll do something about it. And that's the underlying issue, if you will, is where else do we have a crime that you basically get to do it once for free? And then we get to deal with you after that. In terms of uh, prosecution, a lot of times uh, we aren't prosecuting for the criminal trespass because we choose to pro prosecute for the crime itself. That destruction of property, that driving in circles, spinning cookies through the pasture, driving through the mud and disrupting the livestock, etc. Uh, becomes the destruction because for a rancher, we grow grass. Grass is our livelihood. Whether livestock eat it, the birds frolic in it, the antelope run through it, the cows eat it. If the grass isn't growing, that's the value to the property that we that we raise in order to receive our income as a rancher, so to speak. So the the underlying destruction that happens, or a fire, or a tearing down, or the shooting, or the breaking of glass all of those kinds of things, it's sometimes easier to prosecute for that actual act as opposed to the act of trespassing that they got there in the first place. So in many cases, that seems to be the case. There was a question uh, raised on, on the, the kind of inferred, what do we do uh, in terms of someone knowing they aren't supposed to be there? And the, the proposed change is taking the word knowing he's not authorized to do so to merely saying when not authorized to do so. And I think it's important that we kind of step back a second and say, would a logical person say you're authorized to go drive out there and just drive? Um, not sure by whom do you receive that authorization to just go do that. So uh, this kind of steps it back to somewhat of today's sense of, of where um, property rights and liability uh, should probably lie. The dilemma that we also spoke during the last section uh, before you was the issuance of the signs and notice. Many of the other states deal with this issue of providing notice by the unsightly posting of 
car tires, every fifth steel post, big white letters, no vending, no trespassing, every fifth post. Therefore, my property is posted. We talked about that's not with today's GPS, phones, maps, abilities, kind of where we are. Not real sure that we should turn Wyoming into a state that has car tires every fifth post as a standard for our notice to the public. You aren't authorized to just go there. Uh, the signage, uh, where there's a couple of different cases for the wording on the signs uh, for notice to the public. Did it say trespass, trespassing? You know, you come up with all kinds of court cases uh, for trying to decide how that language should be appropriate on the sign. Uh, somebody will challenge because they, they obviously are, are working on not being found guilty of the offense. I think one of the points of note is the uh, fine. Uh, the proposal is to make the fine the same as it is for game and fish, which is what has been for years, the six months and, and to $1,000. And as you heard, the Supreme Court bond amount, for the bond is 400, a little over $400. So in terms of consistently consistency, we end up with the game and fish at 1,000. We have uh, the criminal trespass at seven, uh, or excuse me, uh, yeah, 750 and raise it to a thousand for the sake of consistency between the two. And I'm sure I would agree that the Supreme Court can probably uh, set that as a bondable amount as well uh, with a bond amount that would be allowed. It is difficult to um, uh, catch trespassers. It's one of those fleeting crimes. Someone will call and say, hey, someone's out driving around in my pasture, my horse, how did you notice that? Oh, well, my horses came running over the hill. I, I, I went to see why they were running over the hill. Found this guy out there driving, started waving at him, and he took off. It's it's difficult from time to time to catch up with these people. Oh, wait, they were driving there, and they took off. I'm pretty sure they assumed they weren't authorized to be there, I'm thinking. Otherwise, they probably would have left and said, well, officer, what can I do for you? Why do you want to talk to me? But they didn't. They, they took off. So I think most people get it. The county attorney has the discretion of prosecution or not. That discretion lies to boot with that story. We've heard of the affirmative defense pieces that may be applicable to fit. Uh, we can make this deal work, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Odekoven. Questions for Mr. Odekoven? Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, uh, Mr. Odekoven, just to clarify, you'd agree with me that current law requires that to be guilty of criminal trespass, you either have to be given notice or you have to know that you're not authorized to be there. Mr. Odekoven? Right? Madam Chair, almost. You have to know that you weren't authorized to be there by receiving notice in one form or another, either through signage or verbal from an officer of the landowner. Representative Stith, any follow-up? <laughs> Those were excellent leading questions. Um, anyone else? Mr. Odercoven? Sheriff, anything you'd like to add? Somebody, Representative Punnell, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a quick question on the fix. I Would you say that uh, uh, my question would be, I know there were other states that listed trespass where it's just basic, simple. You have to have permission from the landowner to be there. No signage, no nothing, just straight forward. Would that be more simpler bill? Mr. Odekoven? Madam Chair, that would certainly be a simpler bill. That's actually already in statute for the provision of hunting at night, for example, in the game of fish. You have to have permission, it's written permission from the landowner to be there in order to do that. So the concept exists in a specific uh, case. That concept could clearly uh, be brought forth in this. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Odekoven. Chair? Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I would just like to add that um, to, to kind of reinforce the, the idea that these are not as common prosecutions as we are, as we have reports of them. Um, there has to be the report. We have to show up to investigate. Um, we have to gather the evidence and find out if there is enough evidence to prosecute and then make the decision to cite or arrest. 
And then there's that second layer of the prosecution determining if there's adequate evidence to move forward. And then, of course, the judge and or jury determining the guilty ver verdict in the end. So it is quite the long process to get to that um, and conviction point with a, a lot of layers in between. So these um, are not taken lightly and uh, um, you know, we end up with those first time warnings almost uh, in, in all cases, essentially all cases. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions for the sheriff? Representative Washett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sheriff, same question I asked Mr. Barron. When you think about this in the context of a more urban area rather than a rural ranch area, um, where there are a lot of people and lots of small lots and yards and neighborhoods and businesses and parks and so forth. As you read this proposed statute, do you have any concerns about how this might work in a more urban area? Sure. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, Representative Washett, I, I don't have those concerns. I can speak only of Sheridan County's enforcement and our relationship with our community and our county attorney's office. And, you know, the example of a, a young child cutting the corner on an empty lot, um, by definition of this law, if it were to pass as written here, they would be trespassing each time they cut the corner lot. Are we in law enforcement going to take that, um, uh, uh, you know, um, proactive law enforcement step to cite or arrest someone for something like that? We have to go back once again to you need a, a victim and you need an investigation and you need evidence. And most times that's going to stop right there with um, the law enforcement officer making the common sense decision that uh, a warning or an education um, and not the involvement of the criminal justice system is best in that case. So yeah. Sheriff, what you're saying is, is that cutting corners <clears throat> is okay for our youth? <laughs> <laughs> no comment, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else for the Sheriff? Representative Burlingame. <clears throat> Madam Chair, Sheriff, if you have the opportunity right now to either cite or warn, can you tell us what percentage of the time that given, you know, your, your own desire, you would choose a citation over a warning? Say you have 500 cases. What percentage of those do you? Sheriff? Madam Chair, um, Representative Burlingame, I, I would say that it's, off the top of my head, less than 10% that are cited. And there's always some other aggravating factor involved. They received notice before. Um, there was some sort of cat and mouse game involved here where we believe that there was some ulterior motive and, and the, um, the easiest way to stop that behavior from happening in the future is, is to cite for the trespassing because we can come up with that evidence. Um, we get calls oftentimes from Game and Fish that uh, they were reported by a landowner they were called by a landowner to investigate a trespass to hunt, and their investigation revealed that there was no actual hunting that took place because there's no game down. Um, yet the trespassing still occurred, so then that becomes a sheriff's office responsibility. And then once again, a willing victim, um, and then all the evidence that you need to get uh, a successful prosecution. And um, I would be more than happy to research the numbers and provide those to you if you would like, but the percentage is very low. Thank you. Anything else for the sheriff? All right. Thank you, Mr. Odekoven. Thank you. Mr. Riemann, anything from the county commissioners? No? Anyone else? Like, yes, let's hear from Gillette College Police. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I do work for the College Police Department. I speak on behalf as a uh, private citizen and sportsman. Um, and I just want to bring to the attention the committee. Um, I, I agree that the proposed legislation does strengthen landowners' rights. And um, we heard some of that testimony earlier, and I'm all in favor of that. But as a sportsman, I think there's some other landowner rights that need to be considered, and I would ask the uh, committee to consider moving forward as well, and that is public landowner rights. Um, as an avid sportsman, I use a lot of the technology that has been discussed with GPS. I know um, exactly where land boundaries are, and I do my due diligence to um, stay on private property. Um, despite my best efforts, um, there have been a lot of efforts made by landowners to prohibit sportsmen from accessing land that is, in fact, public. Um, and I would just ask you guys to consider as we look at revisiting our trespass issues that maybe it would be appropriate to consider 
um, something to the effect of interfering with public land access um, as an inverse response to trespassing. Um, because essentially landowners have the ability to use public land for their private, um, for their private use. We heard testimony about most fence lines aren't on the private ground or on the proper property line. Um, generally, it's because it was ran where it was easiest to. Um, I found fence lines that are clearly marked no trespassing um, almost a quarter mile off of where the actual property line is because there's a large rugged valley where the property line is. As a sportsman, that's valuable land um, in the pursuit of game, and the landowner is essentially restricting access to it because people who don't have the due diligence um, to know exactly where those lines are aren't able to access that land because it's posted. Um, excuse me, please silence your phones. Um, because it's posted uh, attempting to prohibit public access. Um, I've even had uh, confrontations with landowners um, who were not aware where their own property lines were, and they were attempting to run me off of public land, believing that it was, um, in fact, their their private land. Um, the use of technology and GPS, I've been able to pull out and show them, nope, here's my map. I pay $15 a month for the subscription to this service to provide me updated boundaries. Um, I am on public land. And if you want to contact the sheriff or Game and Fish, we're happy to have that discussion. Um, and generally, they realize I know a little bit more than they did, um, and they back down, but if somebody doesn't have those resources at their fingertips or aren't comfortable having that conversation with the landowner, they're being deprived uh, of access uh, to land that is theirs as a public landowner. So um, I just wanted to bring that up for your consideration, and I would stand for questions. Thank you. Sir, thank you. I don't think we were able to get your name. Oh, I apologize. I'm Chad Trevi. Thank you. I appreciate you being here and bringing up a, that, that interesting issue as it relates here. Any questions? Representative Gray. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Officer Trevi, I, I just uh, appreciate your comments. I'm just curious on the bill itself. If you uh, do, you have a feeling on the bill itself, um, the language in, in the bill that's the bill draft that's before us. I mean, um, I understand your points, but I just wanted to see if you had a, some comments on. Them. Yeah, in, or, in order to maintain a division in the capacity in which I'm speaking, I don't have a professional opinion on the. Uh, on the bill, and uh, I just want to provide more comment on the, the public landowner uh, rights. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Oh, Senator Anthony Dalton. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just curious well, while you're talking about that kind of issue, I thought I heard somewhere once too where um, it was hard for sportsmen to get access. I thought it was to Elk Mountain, let's say it was that, because somebody brought all of the land around it privately and the oil and gas people in this memo are allowed to get access over private land in order to be able to get to their wells as long as they pay reasonable compensation. And I'm wondering, do we even think about that when we're thinking about these trespass lands? And have you encountered that where you're not able to get to some public land just because it's encircled all the way by private? Uh, it's very common. Mad uh, Madam Chairman, uh, uh, Senator, yes, that's, that's a very common. Um, and, you know, I'm part of several organizations that do work towards land utilization and preventing um, land closures, we call it landlocked, landlocked private lands, or public lands, um, and very frequently, in fact, there was an issue a couple months ago in Cody, as an example, uh, county was getting ready to surrender a public easement to private, uh, just because they didn't want to maintain the road, but in doing so, it would cut off access to a couple of thousand uh, acres of public land, um, so some sportsman groups got together and urged the county to um, keep keep that, easement, that public easement just for the purposes of being able to access that, that public land and not allowing it to go to a landlocked status. Thank you. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Senator Boner. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I think well, we and I just curve the table a little bit because right. I can't I see any of you. You each block each other. So, um, so I, I don't know if you had a chance. Have you seen the specific legislation that we're looking at? Our, um, because it seems like it does talk to some of your concerns where, you know, the um, use of GPS, as you use in your example, is in fact an affirmative defense. And obviously, if you're, you know, not trespassing, you're not trespassing. To begin with, the example you gave, where the, the fence lines are off. Um, so, to the extent which this new law would encourage use of GPS, and that you know, more information being out there in the hands of, of the general public, do you think that would be maybe a, a good compromise if we move forward with allowing for use of GPS as a reasonable defense against trespass? Uh, Madam Chairman, Senator, um, I, I do agree that it is a reasonable defense. I think the point I was making is that potentially there 
um, should be some ground on the other side in that it should be unlawful for somebody to uh, intentionally attempt to impede access to public land. Um, so I understand that the uh, using a GPS and being able to say, no, I'm on actually on public land, not private, would be a defense against the trespass. Um, however, uh, that landowner or that oil field worker or whoever is is claiming to control that space that actually does not, I believe should have some accountability against um, deterring public use of public land. Follow up, sir. And I guess maybe I'll see if I can work this into a question, but I'm under the impression there are procedures in, in that, those instances where there's a mistake in posting and I said so I wouldn't quote myself even, uh, but uh, um, it might be something worth looking into to see what the existing statutes say along those lines. Um, and maybe I also want to point out that when you know, oil and gas was brought up and there is a split of state laws too, I mean, that's completely different than uh, you know, the Maryland state is the dominant state and you have a right to access that over private property. That's completely different from uh, uh, um, any other situation I can think of. So I'd just like to point that out. Thank you, Senator Boner. Representative Punnell. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Mr. Trevi, are you, you know, you stated that uh, there a lot of these lands that uh, the state lands, federal lands are surrounded by private property. Have you ever uh, went on to these lands that uh, are surrounded by property that uh, the landowners have come to agreement with Game and Fish and they allow a lot of hunting in there, they allow walk-ins, they, they do a lot of that. So from what you're saying, you've never, never been able to access that property. Is that, is that understand? Is sure. what I understand? Uh, Madam Chairman, Senator Pana, or Representative Ponell, um, I'm not saying that I haven't been able to access lands that were accessible. Um, I'm saying there is a lot of land that is inaccessible because of its landlocked status, I think is the, the question Senator Dunn uh, had asked, unless I misunderstood. We'll follow up, Representative Ponell. Yeah, just uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so you, you've done the walk-in programs and went into these. That's all I was asking is if you'd and utilize those programs that Game and Fish has done with the private landowners to allow access to those uh, state lands. You've done that. Madam Chairman, Representative Ponell, yes, I have. Thank you for your time. All right, I think we have some folks. Okay, please come forward. I'll just say that. Could you let me Oh, I did. Uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson uh, Jill Morrison with Potter River Basin Resource Council. Um, here today, generally in uh, support, uh, our landowners uh, that we work with and represent have had uh, difficulty with trespass uh, from survey crews, seismic crews, uh, entities doing some sort of data testing. Um, what questions we had or maybe options to propose to uh, maybe offer some additional language that would be clarifying in that first portion, a person is guilty of criminal trespass if he enters or remains on or in the land or premises of another person where he is not authorized to be. Um, seems to be, seems like it might make it a little bit more clear um, based on what some previous testimony was. I also believe that it would be a good idea to include the requirement of written permission. Uh, oftentimes, as was explained, and it has been the experience of our landowners, it is very difficult to prosecute for trespass and usually it is just a warning um, and be, uh, if you had to have written permission I think it would be a, a fairly clear uh, issue. I think under B um, this is a little difficult because we do know GPS systems aren't always accurate. Um, what is a greater concern for us is direction provided by a contiguous landowner shall be deemed a positive defense. That could be problematic because contiguous landowners, uh, as was previously testified, it may not be in agreement, may not have any idea of the boundaries. 
some of our landowners, ranch owners, are butt up against subdivisions. Uh, contiguous landowners don't always know the property boundaries. So I think that's a little uh, iffy uh, in terms of trying to be definitive and supportive and clear. Um, and otherwise, I think uh, that's all we have to offer. Well, thank you. Any questions? Thank you for Thank your you. good thoughts. Any additional public comment? My last opportunity. I'm closing public comment. There's always somebody that pops up at the last minute. All right, public comment is closed. Committee? I heard somebody say move, but you're going to need to be more specific. I think Representative Salazar is indicating that the language as provided by the Wyoming Strap Growers Association be uh, turned into a bill draft by LSO. Is there a second? Second. Second by Representative Jennings. Any discussion? Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, uh, I'm going to vote in favor of the motion. Uh, however, I do have significant concerns with the draft that's before us, but I think the point of these meetings is to give us time to take a look at the language. It's significant that we're going from a knowing state of mind, uh, not down to reckless or negligent. We're going all the way down to strict liability, which is a big jump in mens rea requirements. That is, you're taking something, current statute requires that you actually have to know what you're doing is wrong, basically, and we're replacing that to make it a strict liability offense. That's worthy of some discussion. Uh, if I'm also concerned, as Representative Washett mentioned, with the uh, the potential effect on in the urban setting. I think the, the Stock Growers Association, the Rock Springs Grazing Association, certainly have a legitimate interest in dealing with this problem. I'm concerned that if, you know, in the present form, if we passed it, we'd be creating a whole lot of new criminals uh, with a penalty of six months prison, six months jail, excuse me. And I think it's not sufficient to just say, well, we'll trust our law enforcement officers not to enforce the law in the cities. I mean, that's a very odd policy statement to have. Nonetheless, I'm going to be voting in favor of this motion because I think it's a topic that we need to take up. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Stiff. Uh, Representative Salazar, would you consider it a friendly amendment to your motion to ensure that we add the affirmative defenses that are appropriate um, and germane as found in 63302 for unlawful entry as uh, recommended by Mr. Barron? <laughs> Representative Madam Chairman, yes. Representative Jennings, you feel the same? Wonderful. All right. Representative Washa, did you have anything to add? Just a comment, Madam Chair. If I might, uh, my understanding is if we pass this motion, we as a committee will look at this bill again um, prior to finalization. Yes, committee members. So what we're doing today is we're not making any motions or, or approving any bills <clears throat> Um, to come out of this committee. We're simply um, voting on whether or not this issue should continue through our interim work. Um, and, and as we continue to work through the interim, it is helpful to see in substance some of the bill drafts that we may actually be sponsoring and moving out of the interim and into this actual session. So right now the motion is simply to have LSO draft a bill based on the recommendations we've mentioned today. Um, and then we will review that at our next meeting. Um, for additional conversation at that time. That doesn't mean the, the bill will become a Judiciary Committee bill and, and move forward. It's just we agree to continue to work it in the interim. So with that, Questions? everyone in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. Motion passes. With that, I think we'll take a quick five-minute break, and then we'll go on to our last topic for the day, which is public records. <laughs>
All right, back from our five minute break and committee, the end is near. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Our last topic for the day is Wyoming Public Records. We have another wonderful LSO topic introduction. Mr. Fuller. Madam Chairman, I'll start with the, um, the topic summary. I'll move on briefly to uh, Senate File 57 that the legislature enacted this year and conclude with the, uh, the survey that uh, LSO conducted regarding the Public Records Act. Uh, Management Council approved this as priority number two. The committee will undertake a two-year study of the public meetings and public records statutes to modernize statutes in light of changes to the law, technology, and to promote realistic transparency. The Public Records Act um, was first enacted in 1969. Um, the, the Supreme Court has said that the policy of the act is one of disclosure, not secrecy, and that the legislature has stressed the importance of making available to the public records, books, and files of state agencies. In the summary are de the definition, some of the definitions in the Public Records Act. Um, a public record is any information in a physical form created, accepted, or obtained by the state or any agency, institution, or political subdivision of the state in furtherance of its official function and transaction of public business, which is not privileged or confidential by law. This includes paper, electronic, and other physical forms, official public records, and office files and memoranda. The act requires that all public records shall be open for inspection by any person at reasonable times during business hours in the state entity or political subdivision. A custodian um, who is responsible for the records can make rules for inspection um, to protect the records and prevent unnecessary interference. Under current law, if the custodian doesn't have the records or if they're in active use or in storage, um, there must be, and there's an application for the records, the custodian must respond within seven business days acknowledging receipt of the request and notifying um, of the lack of availability. The Public Records Act also contains exceptions um, to the requirement of disclosure. Um, if, if disclosure would be, um, or inspection would be contrary to state statute, federal law or regulation, or prohibited by court rules or a court order, um, then inspection would not be allowed. There are also mandatory exceptions in 164203D um, where records would not be um, open to inspection or disclosure. Um, those include medical records, adoption records, um, personnel files, trade secrets, hospital, school district records, uh, information related to uh, security or the information technology systems of the state. There are other um, exemptions as well that are included that are discretionary where the custodian can deny the right of inspection um, if, if disclosure would be contrary to the public interest. Um, this includes records of investigations by law enforcement, um, test questions and exam information for licensing boards, um, real estate appraisals that are done on behalf of the state or political subdivision, um, and interagency or intraagency uh, memoranda. If a request for um, or an application for a public record is declined or denied, an applicant can seek written reasons for denial. Um, the applicant can also petition the district court for an order that directs the custodian to show cause why um, inspection shouldn't be permitted. The custodian can also move in district court for an order that would restrict disclosure if the custodian believes that disclosure would do substantial injury to the public interest. Um, there are special, there, um, Separate provisions for electronic records. Um, a requester must bear the reasonable costs of um, producing a copy of that. The agency is required to provide an electronic record in alternative formats unless doing so would be impractical or impossible. Um, an agency under current statute doesn't have to compile data, extract data, or create a new document to comply with or respond to a request if doing so would impair the agency's ability to discharge its duties. And the agency doesn't have to allow inspection of the electronic record if doing so would jeopardize the security or integrity of the record or any proprietary software that an agency may use. 
for changes to the Public Records Act from Senate File 57 from this, uh, this past session, um, that act streamlined definitions. Um, the biggest change to the definitions is the use of the term governmental entity. So throughout the act, when there's reference to agency or political subdivision, all of those have been replaced with governmental entity, which is defined as the state, um, an agency, political subdivision, or state institution. Senate File 57 will also require that applications or requests for public records be made to a designated public records person. Each agency or entity um, will be required to designate someone to serve as that person, and that information is required to be listed on the website of the Department of Administration and Information. It requires a governmental entity, um, a governmental entity must respond within seven business days, regardless of good cause, um, after receiving a request to inform the applicant that the records aren't in the custody or control of that entity and that um, entity must give the name and the contact information of the appropriate person who um, has or is using those records. The new act will require um, public records to be released within 30 calendar days after acknowledgement of the receipt of a application, except for good cause. If there is good cause, then the public records must be released on a mutually agreed upon date. Um, and if no agreement can be reached between the applicant and the agency or the entity, um, then the applicant can file a complaint. Senate File 57 also requires the governor to appoint an ombudsman to receive and review complaints. Um, the ombudsman um, is authorized to mediate disputes um, regarding public records requests, prescribe timelines for complying with those requests, and waive any fees to be charged. Um, if a governmental entity under Senate File 57 doesn't release the records on the specified date or fails to comply with an order of the ombudsman, then the applicant can apply to the district court for an order that would direct the custodian to show cause um, why inspection should be permitted, or um, the applicant can file a complaint with the ombudsman. And Madam Chairman, unless there are any questions at this point, I can move on to the, uh, to the survey. Uh, committee, any questions regarding the Public Records Act itself? All right, Mr. Fuller, time for the survey. Madam Chairman, the survey, I'll start with the survey itself. Um, so Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Fuller, so the compilation section, when it says that an agency is not required to compile data, extract data, or create a new document to comply with an electronic record request, um, and I think there's other provisions where it talks about compilation. So. The way that works in practice, does that mean if it doesn't already exist, if the document doesn't already exist, then they don't need to produce it? So say someone has a public records request where they ask for the total cost from, say, June 5th to June 7th, you know, 19, you know, 2005 or whatever, a long time ago. But would you need to actually produce another document? adding up all the expenses or would you just need to provide all the receipts from that period to comply with the statute so i guess my question is is if there's any new document required to be created in in the request is that not required for them to comply with the statute representative gray for the committee's understanding can you point out where you are in the memo that you're referencing what page? well page seven is one of the times where that's mentioned and then it's also another spot when I was reading it, preparing for the meeting, on the third bullet point. But I, that, that's a little bit less stringent because it has that, if doing so would impair the agency's ability to discharge its duties. But I think there's another spot where it says um, that compilation is not required at all. Uh, a, a new document is not required. Thank you, Representative Gray. Mr. Fuller? Madam Chairman, Representative Gray, I can speak to the, the point. It's um, the bullet, it's the third bullet point on the top of page seven. Um, that language applies to the, um, the inspection of electronic records. So in your example, if, you know, if those existed separately in electronic 
format. Um, the agency under it'd be 16.4.202 D3 wouldn't have to compile data, or extract data, or create a new document to provide that information. Um, I don't. I, I think that you know. Perhaps another example would be the creation of a spreadsheet to provide to provide data. Uh, you know, instead of providing discrete documents or the information, you know, I imagine there are requests for a spreadsheet with a list. Um, under that statute, an agency perhaps would not have to create that. Um, in terms of the other language, I believe regarding the um, you know the impairment of duties. All right, thank you. Mr. Fuller, please proceed with the survey. Madam Chairman, I'll start with the, the survey itself. I believe it's attachment A in your, um, in your materials. And, and the survey was one um, to gather feedback on the Public Records Act for the committee, um, directed by the chairman. And, and the survey asked questions regarding the, um, of, of the respondents, the type of entity, the number of public records requests received in the last two years, the number of staff hours spent on those requests, the average size of the, of the request, whether um, the request was for discrete documents, um, zero to 500 documents, 500 to 1,000 or 1,000 or more. Um, questions were also asked regarding the percentage of requests that the agency charged fees for, the percentage of requests requiring legal review, whether the agency has a designated person to respond to and handle requests, whether state agencies use an ETS email word search, um, those agencies can uh, request with ETS to conduct a search of uh, specific terms among state emails, and the top three challenges with complying with the act. Attachment C, Madam Chairman, is um, a brief kind of graphical summary of the results, and um, 177 entities responded, just under half were state agencies and boards. Um, almost 60% responded that in 2018, zero to three requests were received, um, and there are similar numbers for 2017. Um, the most common type of requests were for discrete documents or small, um, which were less than 500. Large requests, and this is the uh, bar chart on the bottom of page two of that document. Um, the large requests were the least common type. Just over, moving to page three, um, just over three-fourths of the requests had no fee charged um, to respond to those. And then the pie chart on the bottom of page three um, provides regarding the designated person, about 38% of respondents had a designated person. 23% uh, said that there was not a designated person. Um, and then the remainder of the responses varied among the agencies. Uh, Senator Cost has a question. Senator Cost. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Fuller. Um, my question is, would you be able to provide the statistics breaking out the different entities on that to see how many of those requests were uh, from large, like the state agencies, municipalities, counties, and then the other smaller. What I'm really concerned about is the special districts and the counties for the smaller counties and districts. Madam Chairman, Senator Cost, um, although that information is not in the um, in the graphical results, it is in the narrative, the issue brief that's provided. Um, the special districts information, um, I believe, starts on page uh, seven. At the bottom of seven, it starts with conservation districts, um, weed and pest districts, and other special districts, where that information is broken down um, among those districts who responded. Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Fuller, so I'm wondering, has LSO done any work on some of these rankings of transparency? Wyoming, in one of the big ones, ranked number 47, um, 50 being the lowest. 
And there's a lot of other ones that have come out. And I think that set off a lot of the discussion on transparency. And a lot of times when we talk about transparency, it, it comes from the opposite side, which is the workload. And then that's another part of the conversation. But I'm just curious if you know of any time LSO has done research about how we rank in general. On Mr. Fuller. Madam Chairman, Representative Gray, um, you know, subject to my colleagues' response as well, um, at least for this project, um, I, I do not believe we looked at any transparency rankings or our standing among other states. Um, I'm unsure if we've done that work in the past. Yeah, for the committee's benefit, the, uh, and as Mr. Fuller indicated, this, the, the genesis for this survey came from, came from my concern over my previous work on the Corporations Committee and the incessant allegations of a lack of transparency in the state and wanting to just get actual data associated with that in a much more measured way as opposed to online national entities claiming that we were not. And so wanted to just start internally with our own government entities to get a greater understanding of the volume of public records requests that they receive, the compliance with those requests, the type of requests, the amount of time associated with those requests, the challenges that they, they identify as experiencing in their ability to comply with those requests and fees that they charge. And just to get, this isn't, obviously 177 replied and, and participated in the survey, which is absolutely remarkable and, and beyond what I expected. And I'm just really thrilled that so many of them took the time to participate. Uh, but really to use this data for us to move forward in making thoughtful legislation instead of just legislation for the sake of, of doing so, but really do it with some data in mind. So the, the, the charge to LSO was not to look beyond um, really our own government entities to understand what public records issues that they were faced with. Mr. Fuller, please continue. Madam Chairman, um, the issue brief, as I mentioned earlier, um, goes through the specifics of each type of, of respondent um, in terms of state agencies, um, state boards and commissions, um, University of Wyoming community colleges, school districts, counties and then conservation districts, weed and pest districts and, and other special districts. Uh, Madam Chairman, the response to the last question regarding the challenges that um, the respondent faced in responding to public records requests, that is included in attachment B um, and those responses were copied verbatim. And, and with that, Madam Chairman, I'm happy to stand for questions. Mr. Fuller, um, Thank you for the wonderful work putting this together. I know Abigail in your office also um, did a lot of the heavy lifting, but this is a really remarkable piece of work from LSO. So, so thank you. Committee questions for Mr. Fuller? All right. Madam Chairman, one, one additional item. I believe it was passed out during, um, during the break or, or right at lunch. There's Another short uh, summary um, at your direction, um, compiling information regarding reporting requirements for, um, for budget information, um, reporting requirements for uh, you know, when information has to be submitted to the legislature, as well as when information has to be posted or published. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions on that as well. Any questions for Mr. Fuller? Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Any comments from the committee right now as it pertains to the survey before we move on to the hearing for Mr. Shellhouse? Okay. Mr. Shellhouse from the Attorney General's office. Madam Chairwoman, Co-Chair Kirk Bride, members of the committee. My name is Ryan Shellhaus. 
I'm with the Attorney General's Office. I've been with the Attorney General's Office since 2003. During that time, I've responded to many public records requests on behalf of the Attorney General's Office, and I've assisted many state agencies uh, in responding to public records requests. I am here today because the LSO staff asked me to come and speak to this committee about the challenges and difficulties that state agencies experience when responding to public records requests. In my experience, there is no state agency against transparency. We all agree transparency is important and the policy behind the public records request or behind the Public Records Act is transparency. We all agree and recognize that's the purpose and that is part of our job in responding to public records requests. It's transparency, we get that. However, there are challenges and difficulties when responding to public records requests. And that's what I'm gonna you know, try to explain today. I've been doing it for quite some time with the, public, with the Attorney General's Office. In addition to the legal responsibility of being transparent, we must keep in mind that agencies have a legal responsibility to keep confidential information private. And there are 30 specific exceptions in the Public Records Act that legally prohibit disclosure to individuals outside of state government, 30 of them. So you have transparency on one hand, that's the purpose, but then we have 30 exceptions that the legislature has created and said, hey, state agencies and political subdivisions, don't turn this stuff over. Now, eight of those exceptions are discretionary. Release of those records is up to the custodian. If disclosure of that record would be contrary to the public interest, and that's a separate analysis that the custodian has to do. So you have eight that are discretionary. Then you have 22 exceptions that are mandatory. They are shall not disclose exceptions. They prohibit the release of certain documents, data, and information. However, there are much more than those 22 exceptions because some of those exceptions have multiple subparts and some of those exceptions incorporate other statutes that make certain records confidential. For instance, one exception, and that's found in 16-4-203D Romanet 5, that prohibits the release of four different types of information trade secrets, confidential commercial information, confidential financial information, and confidential ge geological data. So that's one exception, but it has those four parts. So it's four different types of information that must not be disclosed. It's a shall not. And as part of that exception, it is the agency's responsibility to reach out to that entity that may be provided that information to the state to determine if release would cause substantial harm to the competitive position, position of the entity providing that information. So you have those exceptions. And then in addition, you have a mandatory exception that says you shall not release any information if it's contrary to state statute. And there are many state statutes throughout the green books, the statutes that prohibit disclosure of certain documents, for instance, licensing boards have certain uh, statutes that prohibit disclosure of certain documents the board of medicine the department of audit the division of banking the legislature in title 28 there are certain statutes that prohibit disclosure of certain communications and documents so one statute can't provide any information that's confidential by st state statute balloons out to multiple statutes same for um if release of any information would be contrary to federal law. So there's a specific mandatory exception saying, hey, state agencies, you can't release any information if it would be contrary to federal law. And then in federal law, I can't tell you, I can't even fathom how many confidential uh, statutes there are in federal law. HIPAA, FERPA, social security numbers, it's, it's a lot, put it that way. So agencies must ensure when they're responding to a public records request, transparency is over here and that's important, but they must ensure that they're complying with all those exceptions and not turning over any 
confidential information, data, or documents. In doing so, I can tell you, because I've done it, every page of every record has to be reviewed. It just has to be. There is no shortcut, because if you release a document, a piece of data, a piece of information that's confidential, you've just violated the Public Records Act. It's important to understand here. So a mistake in releasing confidential information, you could say is equal to not turning over the information. You don't want to release information. So a mistake in releasing the confidential information accidentally is equal to not even turning over the document. And some would say that releasing the confidential information is greater is a greater mistake because you can never get that document, that piece of data, that information back. You can't unring that bell once that's out. If you mistakenly withhold something, you can always turn it over. You can always, but if you mistakenly release something, it's out there. You can't unring that. So in reviewing each document, or reviewing each document is important. Because if an employee were to wrongfully disclose a document or information, that could result in a civil penalty of up to $750. And also the Public Records Act mentions damages. So what happens if you mistakenly release something? Somebody comes in and says, oh my gosh, you released my short security number accidentally or some other document that's supposed to be confidential. You could be subjecting yourself to certain penalties. Transparency is important, very important. But the legislature has spoken and said there are lots of confidential documents and the state agencies must abide by those and not turn it over. So although I may say, or I, I said 30 exceptions, 22 are mandatory, much more than 22. There are much more than 22 exceptions. So now I want to give you some real life public record request examples to help you better understand kind of the challenges or the difficulties that state agencies go through when they get a public records request. And there are, let me, let me start here. There are lots of public records requests that are, that are narrow and they're only asking for a few documents and they're reasonable and state agencies, they're easy to comply with. But then there were some other types of public records requests that those that though in responding to those requests, that's when the difficulties and the challenges arise. For instance, I've seen requests where a requester wants all documents to or from a specific employee for the last one to two or three years. So all emails from one employee for two to three years or one or two years. So what what has to happen then is they have to get with me, the state agency. I have to get with ETS, and ETS has to retrieve all the emails of that individual or multiple or of that employee or multiple employees. And then they go and retrieve all those emails. Then they send them back to me, and then I can send them back to the agency. And it could result in 50,000 emails, 100,000 emails, it could result in a lot of emails, a lot of review time. Agencies must review each email, each attachment to make sure that they're complying with those exceptions. It's not as, it's not as simple as ETS retrieving emails and then sending them out to the employee and the employee just saying, oh, just turn them over. Because within those emails, there's going to be lots of emails that fall within those exceptions. And if that individual is a supervisor and they supervise people within those emails are also going to be personnel information. So you can't, if you're a state employee, you can't say, hey, I know you've been here less years than me. I'm going to give you this fun job of reviewing 50,000 emails to make sure I can turn them over. No, the supervisor will have to review those because there could be uh, personnel information that that individual, that that lower level employee cannot see. So this is not a job that you can just, 
you know what, I'm sorry, it's a bad day for you, I'm gonna make you re review these 50,000 emails. They could be, the supervisor may have to review those. And it takes time. You must make sure you're not turning over any confidential information. And if there is confidential information, the next step is you gotta redact certain information in there. Sometimes you can re you, sometimes you can say, I'm not going to turn over that document in its entirety. Other times you have to redact that document. You can still turn it over, but there's some confidential information or data within that subset. And then if the agency has concerns or questions, like, hey, is this confidential? Is this not confidential? Then they come to us at the attorney general's office. So then we review those records also and those emails also. So you have ETS involved in these requests, you have the state agency involved in these requests, maybe one or two employees there. Then you have the Attorney General's office also um, involved in responding to those requests. And the agency, there's nothing in state law currently that will allow the agency to go to a court and say, time out. This is unduly burdensome for us. This appears to us to be what I would call a nuisance public records request because they're asking, they're not asking for on a specific topic. They're not asking for a specific document. We agree, let's be transparent. But when we see requests come in that are this large and this huge, there is no recourse for the Attorney General's Office of the State of Wyoming to come into court and go, Your Honor, this is unduly burdensome for us. There is no recourse. We must process that public records request. <clears throat> and so that's one example. And I, I've seen it multiple times. And it can turn into a very large amount of emails and paper records also. Let's not forget about paper records. There are paper records. And then there's electronic records. You heard Mr. Fuller talk about kind of the two different types. Another type of public records request that we get is, for instance, all documents regarding a specific topic. And they may say, I want to know a certain agency's position on yellow widgets. So I want to understand their position on yellow widgets for the last two or three years. Well, we have to, for emails, we have to go to ETS and have them run a search. So usually we'll run that search on um, a, certain, a certain word search. So we'll have them search for yellow widgets. Well, that's going to grab a whole bunch of emails. Not all of them are going to be on the agency's position on yellow widgets. It's just gonna be maybe just referencing yellow widgets. So there's a lot of those public records requests that can turn up thousands and thousands of emails. But at the end of the day, maybe only 50, 100, or 200 are actually responsive to that request. So that's another type of challenge or difficulty we face. Again, transparency there, it is, it is important to be transparent. These are difficulties that state agencies. Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I, I just wanna understand, you know, the statute talks about the requester bearing costs. And we had this case where there was financial data requested, which I think is a little bit of a different situation from some of the examples of the challenges that, that you've cited where it was an enormous bill that was, that was asked for. And that was ultimately reversed and they paid that bill for what was uh, at the state auditor's office estimated to be the programming time to comply with that request. So, I mean, I, I guess I wanna understand in that circumstance to do a lot of agencies then not charge is that what you're saying or, or was that just another side that wasn't discussed in, in your previous example so when there was a blanket request that you just talked about i mean would most agencies not charge for that or, or because that that kind of thing i guess one piece of i'm going to inter interrupt there representative gray if you go to attachment c page three it provides the chart for how many entities um, charged for their public records requests, and 78.5% did not charge. And then you can see the breakdown for the remaining 20 some percent. Mr. Shellhouse. Um, Madam Chairwoman, Representative Gray, um, I, can, I can respond. 
on, on a lot of these public records requests, these, the fees that um, are in the survey, uh, A&I created public record fee rules for electronic records and, and public records. I think those went into existence in 2016. Since that time, agencies have slowly been adopting those fee rules for electronic public records requests. Um, so yes, there are certain circumstances where an agency, if they have, have adopted those fee rules and they get these big, broad requests, can now request fees. I've seen what's happened in the, what's happened recently is when these big, broad requests come in and we still need to go to ETS, we still need to retrieve those emails and figure out how many emails we're talking about. But then we can go to that individual and say, it may cost $5,000 to respond to that. Do you want to narrow that request? And then it's up to them if they want to narrow that request or pay that fee. But if they pay the fee, it doesn't translate to more staff time or more time to do the request. It doesn't help the agency fulfill the obligation to fulfill that request. It's my understanding the fees go into the general fund. And so it doesn't help with the staff time, but there is fee rules and some agencies have those fee rules. Representative Salazar. Hey, Madam Chair. Um, let me ask you, do you, <clears throat> I want to concentrate on special districts for a minute. Um, do you, or have you received requests from special districts about certain problems that they may be facing, such as um, what you, you know, nuisance reports? Uh, we requesting a large sum of information um, and, and they, unlike agencies, don't have the kind of budget to, to even to begin, perhaps, taking care of that request. Have, have you received any calls? Do you, uh, can you give any anecdotal information on what special districts are going through who, who have much more limited budgets than state agencies? Madam Chairwoman, Representative Salazar. Um, I have not, I don't recall, I don't, I don't believe I've received any um, requests or comments from special districts, uh, but I suspect other individuals, other attorneys in our office probably have in, in helping them, but I have not uh, personally, but you know, you bring up a good point that at the state agency level, we do have, we do this a lot. There are a lot of employees that do this. They have the attorney general's office there to help. Special districts um, you know, do not have that. So for clarity, I think for Representative Salazar, the attorney general's office doesn't traditionally represent any of the special districts, is that right? That is, Madam Chairwoman, yes, that is correct. We have not helped them or I have not helped them with uh, responding to public records requests. Are there folks representing special districts here? Yes. Okay, we'll hear from them later. Okay, Madam Chairwoman. Um, so that, that is another type of public records request, the one that you do a search and you get a, a, a lot of documents. And there are other public records requests where it just asks for all emails of the state agency for the last five years or two years containing these search terms. And if an email contains any one of these search terms, I want you to retrieve it. And I've seen those where it has 40 search terms. And again, those can re result in a lot of public records, a lot of emails to go through. Sometimes they can narrow it though too. So again, even though I'm, I, I'm sitting here saying there are lots of challenges and we get lots of requests, there are reasonable requests too. And we will fulfill those, and those aren't real, those aren't challenge, challenging to fulfill. But on the other side, there are challenges with dealing with these broad requests. And in this day and age, it is easy for individuals to shoot off a request to a state agency via email and say, "Hey, I want all your emails for this, um, for this person, or this person." And agencies can just get inundated with them just one after another because it's very easy and we conduct 
we use emails a lot and we get emails into it. So it's really easy to ask for public records requests via email and they build up. And then what they do is when we retrieve these emails, it's just thousands upon thousands of emails. Um, we've also received public records requests of all communications be between officials in one agency and the following entities for the last eight years. And they list all these entities out. So you have to somehow retrieve them and see if you can uh, see the entities in the two or from line, or if maybe the entity is just listed somewhere in the body of the email. And if you choose that avenue, it says any official in this office between these two entities, and you have ETS do a search, and ETS is great at turning around searches quickly, even though I know they, I think they spent in the survey, they, I don't know if it's two or 300 hours they spent in retrieving emails. But sometimes the entity will be in the body of the email, not in the to or from, so that's not responsive. But you still have to look at that email. You have to make sure it's responsive. You have to make sure you're complying with the act and all the confidentiality exceptions. And then we've also received some public records requests from, from entities or vendors that ask for all pricing information for all purchase information for the last 10 years. And what they're going to do is they're going to market and sell that data. So then we have to see if we have those public records, whether in paper form or electronic form, and try to you know, get those out to that individual. Because there's nothing in, in the statute. There's nothing in the statute that says we can go to court and get some protection from these overburdensome public records requests. And so we're left with um, you know, processing those requests. Now there are many requests that are reasonable and we have no, no issue with those. Uh, the challenge and dif difficulties come when state agencies receive these large, large over broad public records requests. We must review every single document, every page, every attachment. There is no shortcut, it is time consuming we have many confidentiality exceptions. If we release something and it, and it is confidential, that's a violation of the act. So, and, and there's no recourse on the, on the state side. So people forget that while transparency is part of the act and is really important, and we believe in that, confidentiality is also part of the Public Records Act and certain information is prohibited from being released, and if it is released, it could it could be a violation. <clears throat> Representative Burlingame. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I, have you contemplated any language that would balance the rights of the public to access information against the right of the public to not have their information handed out to national groups who are using it to, to sell the data, whether for um, phishing or spamming or just straight across selling it. Madam Chairwoman, uh, representing Berlin Game, um, I have not thought of any uh, potential legislation or a way to balance um, those two competing uh, interests. Um, I, I know there are at least there is one state that has what they call I think an unduly burdened exception. It is one of those exceptions, like the 30 exceptions in Wyoming's law. And, and it has some factors that they look at. And maybe those types of requests, the requests where somebody's asking for lots of information from a state, uh, state agency to either sell that information or market that information, <laughs> maybe it could fall under you know, this unduly burdensome exception. We don't have that in Wyoming's law right now. But in, I, I, think it's, um, I think it's Illinois, the factors they look at is, would compliance unduly burden the agency? Can the request be narrowed? And is the burden on the agency outweighed by the public interest in receiving the information? Now, I don't know if it's perfect for that situation, but it, 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 when you get these huge burdensome requests, in that, in that case, what, what's required is you go to the requester, hey, are you willing to narrow this? And if they're not, then they do this analysis, um, this, this factor analysis. But as, as far as, I don't know if that's 
a great example for your example, um, but I haven't thought of a way to balance um, that information on whether it's for business purpose. I, I suspect some states have it if it's for a business purpose or if it's from an individual that are, they really want the record, they want the, the specific document or if it's coming from a vendor or an entity that they're going to turn around and sell that information. Because right now under state law, the purpose is irrelevant on why they're going to use it. So we have, whether they're going to sell it, whether they're going to do whatever with it, we have to comply under the current state law. Is your title Chief Deputy? Yes, it is. All right, Chief Deputy Attorney General Shellhouse. Is that correct? That is correct. I'm pronouncing Madam your Chairman. last name correctly. Yes. Great. Okay. Have you had a chance to study Senate, Senate File 57 that will go into effect July 1? I have, Madam Chairwoman, I have reviewed it. And what are your thoughts as it relates to the new position of the Ombudsman and solving some of these challenges? One, I looking at some of the survey responses, do you think there's enough work to justi justify a full-time Ombudsman's position to deal with public records requests? with a $125,000 salary associated with it. Chief Deputy. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, um, as far as the Ombudsman, it's hard for me to know how much work is going to go towards the Ombudsman because when I read the, the new Senate file or the new law that's going to in existence in July 1, the Ombudsman is there to potentially mediate disputes and determine if there is good cause, if a state agency is going to go over that 30 day mandatory uh, deadline. But in those same sections that the Ombudsman is, is, is talked about, the applicant or the requester can also go to district court in both of those times. So I just don't know if, there, if the Ombudsman is going to, how busy that Ombudsman is going to be could be he or she could be very busy or, or maybe not so much or maybe the ombudsman uh, the state agencies and requesters and political subdivisions will use the ombudsman um, a, a lot it's just hard it, it's hard for me to know how much time that ombudsman will be used on disputes and these public record type things do you see any issues that you read in reviewing Senate File 57? And what are your concerns about that law coming into effect? Madam Chairwoman, um, one of my biggest concerns is there is the 30, there, there was under current law, if a record is readily available, it must be turned over immediately. And when I think of a readily available document, I think of maybe the plat maps. You can go to state lands and there's public records. You can go in and get the plat map and look at it because it's readily available. But emails, um, most other documents, they're going to either be in active use or storage. So under the current law, if they're in active use or storage, you don't turn them over immediately because you can't. And some of those records, you're going to need to look at them for all the confidentiality exceptions. So currently, it's always been my opinion, you respond to those in a reasonable amount of time. But now under the new law, it requires 30 day deadline in responding to all public records requests in getting the records out, unless the requester otherwise agrees, unless you mutually agree. And let's face it, it has to be up to the requester to agree. Um, I have, if the requester, I've been responding to public records requests a long time, and there's always a disconnect between how quickly a requester thinks you can turn over records and how quickly we believe we can turn over records. So although there's this catch-all of 30-day hard deadline, however, unless otherwise agreed, I don't know if we, I'm struggling to see if we will otherwise agree on a lot of time. Because I think they will say, well, we'll give you another two or three weeks. And we will say, no, we're going to need six months because we have to go through 20 or 30,000 emails. 
So I look at the new laws as a 30 day mandatory deadline. And I look at that from my perspective and from agencies perspective. And I'm telling you, I, I think it's unrealistic and almost impossible because on certain requests, not the run of the mill, I want this document or I want you know, a few emails over here, I want this report or I want this letter. We're not talking about those, but the law doesn't make an exception for the broad request. Now it does have the good cause exception, but the requester is the one that can go or that is authorized to go to the abutment or district court. State agencies aren't. It's up to the requester to go and say, hey, they've blown the 30 day deadline or we can't agree to a, we can't agree so they have to go, they can file, I think, a complaint with the ombudsman and the ombudsman can work it out. And hopefully we work it out and we say, look, if we have to review um, 50,000 emails and I have a, an example here, typically when I was doing it, I could maybe review emails about maybe 100 to 150 to 200 in an hour. And that's if they're run of the mill emails. But if they have a, lots of attachments, they're going to take a lot longer. So if you have a, a public records request that turned up to say 100,000 emails, and that's not everyone, but that's a big one, 100,000. That could take, I had the math here somewhere, five to 750 hours of an employee's time just to review that. And that's not counting, oh gosh, I need to redact these. Maybe I need to talk to the attorney. That's in a perfect world. And 200 emails in an hour is probably on the high end. So it, it, the ombudsman may have his or her work cut out for them to determine the timelines going forward. So to answer your question, I think this 30 day deadline, to me, that's a challenge for agencies. That's a challenge for the attorney general's office. What's your thoughts about the ability for the Department of Environmental Quality to comply when they receive 764 requests a year? Madam uh, Chairwoman, I would, um, from my perspective, I think that would be um, almost Im impossible to comply in the 30 days. But again, here, under the law will take effect July 1. All state agencies and the Attorney General's office, we're going to comply with the law and we're going to do our best and we're going to follow the law. Did, are we going to go past that 30 day deadline sometimes? Well, yeah, I mean, realistically, we will just have to. But we hope at that time the requester maybe understands and instead of saying, I'll give you a couple more weeks to figure this out, maybe they give us six months or a year or understand. But it's my experience, there's a disconnect between what the requester, how long the requester thinks it's going to take and how long a state agency is going to take. So I know Director Parfit's here. Um, because I know DEQ gets a lot of public records requests, but I, I think it's it's going to be a, a tough haul. That 30-day deadline is a tough haul. Representative Stitt. Uh, Madam Chairman, two questions. First off, uh, can you walk us through what happens when you get a request for, say, several hundred thousand documents? Is there a process where you send correspondence back to the requester saying, by the way, whether you intended to or not, this response is going to generate several hundred thousand documents or a big number and we estimate that we're going to charge you however much money for it you know, two hundred dollars zero dollars or seven thousand dollars do you have that kind of process when i do freedom of information act requests i usually put in my letter if this is going to cost more than right. x dollars please let me know because i as a requester may not really want it that badly so that's the first question the second question is is it possible that technology will solve some of your problems uh, with respect to the time it takes to call for these documents. You know, large law firms now, instead of having the associates spending times in warehouses looking at every page at a couple hundred dollars an hour, they uh, are moving toward having uh, you know software programs that uh, call things out. Because it seems like artificial intelligence really could be useful to uh, screen uh, a lot of documents. So for example, if you have categories of confidential documents, presumably those aren't just thrown into the file willy-nilly. Presumably a state agency would code them to make sure that your confidential information, at least of a certain category, of medical records, for example, would not be listed, you know, the medical record wouldn't be tucked between the uh, profit and loss and the balance sheet, for example. So two questions there. One is how do you typically do it for large requests? And second, do you think technology might solve some of your heartache? 
Chief Deputy, how would MedMal technology help with our public records requests? Madam Chairwoman and Representative Stitt, um, I'll, I'll take your second question first, that's okay. Um, I, I don't know what's out there as far as technology, as far as coding. I mean, where we run into the problem is with emails and attachments <laughs> and all the exceptions. And, and I don't know if that would take some software that the employee, when that employee hits send, they code it some way saying this could be fall under this exception or this exception or this exception. So it's organized. Or if when we're going through all the emails, there's some software program that will, will make it easier. I, I guess in my simple mind, in my non-technology mind, um, right now, I, and then the way we've been doing it is we don't want to violate any of those confidentiality statutes, so we're just page by page, attachment by attachment. But in the future, I don't know, maybe there is a way to lessen the load. But at this point, at least for us, I don't know of a way. As far as your, your, your first question, um, Representative, on um, when we get a big request. So if we get a really big request and we know it's going to generate tens of thousands of emails, we will work with ETS to do the search terms to pull those emails. And then the agency at the same time, has they have to look through their paper records to see if anything is responsive that way. And then, and, and for paper records, um, the only thing state agencies uh, can charge are the copying fees, but for electronic records, it's the, it's the cost to produce the electronic public record. So when we get there, we have to look at the emails, how many they are, we kind of look at it and go and estimate. And by rule, if the agency has adopted that rule, they must reach out to that requester and say, we got your public records request, it's turned up a lot, here is our estimate, it's going to cost, or it's gonna take us this amount of time, and we have clerical time at a certain number, a certain uh, uh, hourly rate, we have IT time, and then we have administrator time or supervisor time at a certain hourly rate. And then under our rules, the state rules that A&I created, there was a $180 threshold, which when A&I created that, they said, look, we, we don't want to charge for somebody just coming in and wanting a few electronic public records. So there's, there's this $180 threshold, which I think comes out to be, if you spend six to eight hours on electronic public records requests, there is going to be no fee. But in the big request, we write back to that requester and say, it's going to cost $5,000. Would you like to narrow it? Or if you wanna pay us the 5,000, we'll start. But again, that doesn't lessen the staff time. That doesn't lessen the time it's going to take, but they've now paid under our rules, the certain fee. So we do reach out and ask, and these fee rules are new. These public record fee rules are new. Um, agencies are, are adopting them. Uh, and it has worked where you send that estimate as required and they come back and they go, you know what, we'll maybe try to narrow that request to see if we can get within that $180 threshold. So that, that's the process. I don't know if that answers your question. Any additional questions for the Chief Deputy? <coughs> Representative Washington. Madam Chair, thank you. My question is this, please don't throw anything at me, but for these small boards and commissions around the state, might it be feasible if those boards and commissions submitted all of their records on a quarterly basis and were archived someplace within state government where we do have more resources um, rather than having those information requests going to those small boards and commissions, the requests could come to the state. Feasible or not? Chief Deputy, if you can answer. Madam Chairwoman, Representative Washett, um, I don't have anything to throw at you. So um, I, I don't believe that's feasible. Because under our Public Records Act, a custodian is the person that may have physical custody or the entity that is the custodian, but maybe they, they place the record someplace else. So if the, the special district or the small entity got the public records request, they would still be obligated, but just whether it's feasible, I don't see how that would be feasible because I can tell you 
right now, even though the state has more employees and we have an AG's office that has, you know, multiple attorneys, 65 attorneys or so, we're already busy doing public records requests. So that would just be more public records requests. And then we're not familiar with all of their documents. So some of the exceptions, the attorney client privilege, maybe the deliberate process, privilege, all these other confidential exceptions, since we don't know their records, like they know their records and we don't know what was being talked about in those records, it would be hard for us to review them and then also make sure we're not turning over any confidentiality uh, information. So to answer your question the best I can, I don't believe that's feasible. All right, everyone, it is five o'clock. In light of the fact that I do want to get us out of here quickly and on time, and there are a lot of people that came here to talk about this topic, Chief Deputy, I am going to give you three more minutes, and then we're going to move on um, to some other folks in the room. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, you know, uh, you know. I, I guess if anybody has any questions, certainly, uh, you know, I'm here for a couple more minutes. Um, no, but, we'll have you stand by. Oh, okay. You'll be um, you'll be close. But <laughs> but here's here's the point I want to make. We understand transparency is important, and I know people are going to probably get up after me and talk about transparency, transparency, transparency. And I agree, transparency is important and responding to reasonable requests, requests that are narrow and concise, we get it. But on the other side in the Public Records Act, which is also mandated, is all these confidentiality exceptions. It is not as simple as here's some records, let's pull these emails, it's really easy. Because as state employees, we have many duties. Responding to public records requests is, is one of those duties. But when those duties and the demand to respond to public record requests start overshadowing, and for some individuals, that becomes the main duty, I think there are problems there. Um, because, and I've seen it, where I've spent weeks upon weeks just doing public records requests. Weeks upon weeks, and um, just to get through these things. And so, state employees kind of get caught in the middle of complying with the confidentiality exceptions, which are very important. And the legislature has each, each session, it seems like there's a, one or two new comp, you know, exceptions. There are very important and there is purpose behind those exceptions, but you also have transparency. So with this new law going to effect on this 30 day deadline, employees are going to be kind of caught in the middle, like, oh my gosh. I got to get these records out within 30 days or some other agreed upon deadline, which I don't know what that is. I don't know what they're going to agree to, but we got to get those moving on because I don't want to violate the Public Records Act. But then you got to comply with all these confidentiality exceptions. And do you start reviewing these quicker and quicker and quicker? Or do you say, look, I can't let any of this confidential information out. I just won't hit that deadline and they're going to have to take me to the abutment or district court. I'm just going to have to explain my case because right now district courts get involved when a record is denied after you've produced the record and maybe you or and you've denied some other ones, they go to the district court, but under the new law, they can go to the district court or the abutment early on to see if, what timelines there are. And then they can go to the abutment or district court later on also to see. So district courts are going to get involved potentially much earlier in these public record disputes. And I don't, I can't speak for the judges, but I don't believe judges like to deal with public record disputes. Maybe they do, but it's just gonna, they're gonna have to handle these more often. Um, so anyways, with, with that, um, I will finish up if there are any questions, Madam Chairwoman. Stand by, we're gonna move to okay. some other agencies. Thank you, Chief Deputy. Who would like to come forward next? Representative Salazar would like to. DEQ? DEQ, I think you are the agency in the state that is subject to the most public records requests. Congratulations. You win the no award problems. tonight. Gold stars all around. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm Todd Parfit, Director of the Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, we had similar discussions around the public records uh, last year with uh, Senate File 57. 
Uh, so for some of you, this may be uh, a repeat of what I shared there. Um, but as an agency, we have always taken and we, we understand public records uh, requests are important and we take it seriously. Um, but I think it's important for th this uh, uh, committee to understand that we've seen a tremendous increase and I'm not sure I can explain exactly why, uh, I think just accessibility, uh, but we've seen an increase in public records requests uh, since 2012 of over 100%. So. Uh, last year, we had 764 public records requests. Uh, this year, we're on pace for 800. Can you tell us how many employees do you have devoted to responding to these public records requests? And do you have any employees that are solely devoted to this? Um, Madam Chair, uh, that, that's a difficult one to answer, but yeah, we have three staff that are dedicated primarily to public records requests. But to answer your question, you also have to consider that when we get these records requests, it often involves other agencies. So we have ETS, we have the Attorney General's Office, uh, and then we have the three that are basically charged with monitoring and, and uh, uh, ensuring that the records requests are on time and so forth. But then you have the program staff that get involved because it relates to the, the specific request. So that, that can vary widely depending on the nature of the you have had an opportunity to review Senate File 57, obviously, and we're part of some of those conversations. What are your primary concerns about that, that law coming into effect? Uh, so the, the primary concern uh, would be with the 30 days. Um, now, of the, of, of the requests that we received last year, I would say the majority of those were able to, and, and when I say majority, about 90%, fall into a category uh, that we are able to fulfill those well within the 30-day time frame. Uh, there are others that are probably close. Uh, I'd say about 3% fall into a category that are outside of uh, the 30-day timeline. So this year, as an example, uh, we've had 358 public records requests and seven of those have fallen outside the 30-day time frame. Now, Senate File 57 hasn't come into effect yet, but just to give you, so about seven, so for the year, we're gonna be looking at 14 or 15 that are gonna be in a category where they're large enough uh, because there are enough emails and so forth that we wouldn't be able to achieve that within 30 days. And as you heard previously, then we would be having a discussion about, can we have more time? or do we have to go to the ombudsman, or are we going to district court? Questions for DEQ, Mr. Parvin. Uh, Co-Chairman Kirkman. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Parvin, I assume you never got to go to the Appropriations Committee and ask for three new positions to review public records requests, that you had to absorb uh, all this extra work in your existing positions. Is that true? Uh, it is true, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Kirkbright, it is true that uh, we have been absorbing those with our existing staff, and usually we're not asking for positions, we're trying to save the ones we have. Representative Stitt. Madam Chairman, uh, Mr. Parfit, under Senate File 57, if you've got one of these requests that's going to take more than 30 days to respond to, isn't the mechanism in Senate File 57 for the department to send a letter to the requester saying good cause exists for not getting this done in 30 days and uh, we, you know, we'd like an extra 30 or 60. So, I mean, does, isn't there a, a contemplated mechanism that you will be able to use? Mr. Parfit? Yeah, so um, Madam Chair, uh, Representative, uh, yeah, there, there, there is. And I, I might just add to that and say that when we get the request, if there are large requests, uh, and, and as you had pointed out earlier, uh, we will notify the requester of the, the size of the request and the cost associated with that. And uh, oftentimes, and, and there is an example where we had one request that would have been over 200,000 email requests. Um, and we were able to work with the requester to narrow the scope of the search so that it was about uh, a seventh of what the original request was. Representative Pelkey. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm curious, 
you you notice significant growth in the number of requests. Where are those requests coming from? Mr. Corbett? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative, the majority of the requests that we receive fall into a category of, um, uh, I would say, your, your uh, consultants and so forth asking for information related to business growth opportunities for themselves. Uh, then we see a few special interest groups that will key on uh, either national issues or regional issues. And those tend to be the larger requests because there is a lot of information related to those requests. And a follow-up? Follow-up, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you cited an example where you had in excess of 100,000 email requests um, and uh, you notify the requester of, of the anticipated time and cost. Um, how much would a a request of that size generally cost or? Mr. Parfit? Uh, so Madam Chair, Representative, um, this uh, request came in prior to our, our rule on uh, charging fees for electronic records. Uh, so we didn't, ha I don't have a cost estimate, but I can tell you that the, we estimated the time associated with that request originally was 1,100 hours. Additional questions for Mr. Parfit? Do you have any other concerns with Senate File 57? Uh, that you can think of right now? Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I guess the, the uh, consideration of the 30 days, as I mentioned, also includes the time that it takes, not just the DEQ to do its, its work, but it's ETS, the AG, and then the agency. And to do that on these larger requests within that 30 days, uh, that, that's the challenge. All right. Thank you, Mr. Parfit. Who else would like? Representative Jennings. Mr. Parfit, you please come back. Yeah, I just have one quick question, Madam Chairman. Thank you. So when you get these huge requests like this, and, and I don't know if we would get this solved or not, but when you're going through that and you got 1,100 hours in that, do you then archive those emails or something in something that says, next time I get one of these, <laughs> I'm not spending a full 1,100 hours. Do you have a, something in place for that? Mr. Parfit? So, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Jennings, uh, that's, that's actually a very good question. So we have invested recently in a system that's called Next Request. Uh, we pay about $11,000 a year for this, and that... Uh, helps us organize our records requests. It tracks where we are uh, in fulfilling those records requests, but it also gives us the ability to post the results of those records requests on the website. So if others want to see the same information, it's already there. Brilliant. Thank you, Mr. Parfit. 11,000. <laughs> Any additional, Mr. Riemann? Madam Chairman, Chairwoman, sorry, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee, again, Jeremiah Riemann with the County Commissioners Association. Uh, this is an issue that I have a lot of experience with. Uh, in my previous ex uh, position with the governor's office, I was often subject to these. In fact, I may be the only individual in the room that was subject to a subpoena, two federal court decisions, and over 20, or, or 20 hours of uh, deposition time specific to my public record. So, I've been around the block on this issue. Gold star for you too, Mr. Reagan. thank you. <laughs> uh, I wanted to just comment on a few things relative <laughs> to uh, the issue as it relates to the counties. Uh, one of the difficulties that uh, some of the counties are working through right now is in designating who is responsible to be that person. Uh, in some, in most instances, the county is electing that the county clerk uh, will be that individual. Uh, in other counties, uh, the clerk has said, uh, by God, no way am I going to be that person. Uh, and uh, the commissioners are trying to work through uh, a discussion with another elected official. And the other issue that they're working through is, uh, is this something that they designate multiple, uh, perhaps department individuals uh, that are responsible? So uh, it, it's certainly something that's not come easy uh, in trying to uh, work it out at the local Level. Mr. Riemann, how much of that hesitation do you know for individuals 
willing to serve in the position is as a result of the fact it's a, it has a criminal penalty associated it and the legislature just contemplated making it a felony in the past year. Do you know if that is causing the hesitation within the counties? Madam Chairwoman, I think that's dir directly uh, the issue that uh, is resulting in this, despite the fact that I think it came out in a much better place relative to this. But uh, the threat that already existed in previous drafts of the bill uh, certainly causes pause for many of those individuals. Madam Chairwoman, uh, a few other things that uh, have existed as problems. Uh, it's been mentioned, the word immediately. It comes up a couple of different times uh, in Senate File 57, uh, the immediate turnover of records, uh, if you uh, uh, have them in your possession. Uh, sometimes you have them in your possession, but it does require uh, that uh, review, so you can't comply with that. Uh, there's also the immediate uh, forward to the custodian. Uh, what does that mean for that designated person uh, in this scenario? Uh, there is also uh, an issue that exists around uh, formatting. A lot of these requests are coming in with specific requests on how that information uh, should be returned uh, to these individuals. Uh, a lot of these records at the county level uh, are in paper form, uh, are not digitized. Uh, thankfully, we made some improvements in statute this year to allow that to start happening, uh, but that becomes a problem uh, in compliance. Uh, and thankfully, I think there are uh, some provisions in Senate File 57 that don't require that, but nonetheless, uh, that's an issue that does exist out there. To just highlight it a little bit more, uh, there are groups in the state that uh, will deem counties in non-compliance uh, if they don't provide it in the specific format uh, that is requested, despite the fact that they are responsive to the records. Uh, and as an example, uh, Converse County uh, has uh, invested in uh, the OpenGov uh, format. I believe they pay about $20,000 a year in order to uh, release their records. If you go on to their main page of the county, uh, there's a link to OpenGov, little icon there. You can click on it and then begin to go through uh, the various records uh, that they uh, make available, in particular their receipts and, and payment uh, records. Yet uh, again, that county is deemed non-compliant because they're not providing it in the specific format that's uh, been requested by some groups in the state. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out, there's been a lot of conversation about the ombudsman. I certainly think that the ombudsman is going to be a positive tool. But if, if my read is correct, the current version of Senate File 57 only makes that position available to the applicant, not to the counties, to the state agencies, to the other entities that are ultimately responsible uh, for responding to these records. So, if there was one change that you might uh, consider, that's one area uh, to take a look at um, uh, in this. Uh, the other thing that I'm hearing a lot of from the counties is a request for some sort of uniform guidance and training uh, around these. A lot of the information or, or the response that we get uh, is consult your attorneys, uh, which is only going to result in perhaps 23 or 700 uh, different approaches uh, to this issue, uh, which isn't uh, ultimately going to be helpful. So uh, perhaps we can consider how that might be built into the conversation uh, moving forward. Uh, and Madam Chair, one, the last thing that I would just uh, say is that uh, you are going to see more of these records requests come from business entities. Uh, there's certainly those public purpose uh, you know, responses and requests that come in. And we need to be, uh, I think, uh, personally, keep those at top of mind. But there are more and more businesses that are building their models around data. Uh, I'll just give one quick example, Uber. They have the largest market cap of any company in the world. And it's simply because of the data that they have available to them from all of us uh, using their ride sharing service. And data is king and data is going to be more important to companies moving forward, and we're going to get more voluminous records requests uh, that are going to demand time, and, and personally, I believe that there should be some distinction in how we respond to those two different distinct requests.
Mr. Raymond, I would be happy to hear your creative thoughts about how to do that in the future, so start thinking. Um, any questions from the committee? Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair Chairman, Mr. Riemann. You know, I want to talk a little bit, and I was hoping to ask the previous presenter as well about this, uh, about what would be called, I think, blanket financial requests, which we've had a lot of problems with. And I think at the state level, um, I think the state auditor is going to be rolling out this feature where online pretty much every transaction and, and they're going to have confidential what needs to be confidential so i think at the state agency level hopefully we're, we're going to be pretty close there this summer but in terms of the counties and entities of the counties and also school districts well, that's different for from your perspective that's a uh, a different entity that that your organization doesn't cover um to me in terms of the financial requests which are very important i mean i i just think these entities should be scanning pretty much every invoice and if they're confidential then they then they label it that way so that it doesn't that it, what's redacted needs to be redacted and then the p cards you just need to go through those debit transactions and and look at those and it shouldn't be that difficult i think to comply with the financial public records requests which are um, very very important in terms of uh, making sure that double dipping is not occurring, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess we haven't talked too much about financial public records requests, which really precipitated a lot of things the last couple of years. A lot of it was at the state level, but, but you know, a lot of the organizations that want this data to, to help in terms of transparency, they send out requests to all entities of the state. So I guess that's my question in terms of what would be called blanket financial requests. I'm going to just piggyback onto that, Mr. Reeman, and just put you on the spot. Uh, is there anything in the Public Records Act that differentiates between any record, whether it's financial or not? And then to Representative Gray's point, should the committee consider making two different classes of information, one related to financial and one not? Madam Chairwoman, Representative Gray, uh, I'm not aware that there's uh, that distinction and I don't know that I've given enough thought or, or discussed it with my members in order to respond on whether there should be uh, that distinction. I will say that the counties, uh, you know, Commerce County has certainly led the way in terms of its open gov uh, platform and I, a number of other counties are looking uh, to that resource. Uh, we are participating in the conversations uh, that the governor and the auditor are uh, hosting around uh, financial transparency. In fact, we'll be there at the table uh, tomorrow when that group uh, meets. Uh, I do think that you'll see more entities moving in that direction of providing that resource uh, and just simply uh, releasing that data. Uh, but that also goes to my point that uh, that is being responsive to uh, you know, the larger transparency issue yet a number of entities are deeming uh, counties non-compliant on that issue uh, when in fact they're using a different platform than what is perhaps requested. Any additional questions for Mr. Riemann? Yeah. Representative Salazar? I think, thank you, Madam Chair. I think I know the answer, but I just want to double check. So if you have a person, an employee at the county looking at the, these documents to make sure there's no personal information, and they miss one because they're looking at a hundred thousand documents over a period of time. Are they then held personally liable or is it the county that's held liable for the release of that information that should not have been made public? Madam Chairwoman, Representative Salazar, I don't know that the statute necessarily defines who's ultimately responsible, but does apply the penalties that they do exist. I believe civil penalties uh, in particular. Uh, I think in most instances, the county would likely pick up that tab. They're not going to leave uh, the individual hanging. Uh, that's been the conversation that I've heard. And just what follow up, uh, Madam Chair? Well, then that's an important question because there's a difference between a special district and, and, a, and a state agency because obviously there's deep pockets in one and not so much in the other. So, um, okay, thank you. Anything else for Mr. Riemann? Representative Burlingame. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'm just gonna throw this out here. Do you, on the face of it, see any issue with um, 16.4202 
which currently reads, all public records shall be open for inspection by any person at reasonable times, comma, so on and so forth. Two, all public records shall be open for inspection by any person with a compelling state interest. Madam Chairwoman, Representative Burlingame, is, is the question, do I have an issue with that? Do you think that that would capture the meaning of what we've talked about today, balancing the rights of privacy that we think is inherent in citizens of Wyoming against the unreasonable monetizing of our personal information by outside sources? Mr. Reed, if you would like to answer that constitutional question of a government yeah. state interest, I would love for you to hear from the parent. <laughs> Madam Chairwoman, I, I think my response would be, I don't know that the statute uh, necessarily contemplates it. Right now, it's very broad, and and uh, its requirement of entities to provide that information and not make a distinguishing uh, determination about whether this is a business interest or whether this is a public purpose interest. But do you agree, excuse me, Madam Chairwoman, follow, follow through. But do you agree that there is a need? Um, I mean, I, I think you're the only person who's really spoken directly to uh, where we are headed with uh, data mining and how large of an issue we are on the precipice of it becoming. And rather than waiting until all of our private information is out there in the public domain and has been monetized, that there's an opportunity here now to preempt that. Mr. Rubin. Madam Chairwoman, uh, Representative Burlingham, I think that's what I'm suggesting, that, that that's a conversation that we should be having right now about how do we protect uh, the appropriate information? Do we assign a priority to public purpose versus business uh, in terms of the response uh, that we give to that and those other conversations that should come a part of that? All right, Mr. Raymond, thank you. We're gonna hear from some other folks in the audience in light of time. Just Director Lampert. Madam Chair, Bob Lampert, Director of the Department of Corrections. I promise to be very brief. Uh, I just wanted to inform the committee in regards to the three types of requests that the agency is seeing, Department of Corrections is seeing, that are a little bit uh, troublesome or burdensome. The first of all, first of those is the inmate requests that are just filed for nuisance reasons, just because they don't have anything else to do other than tie up staff time. The second is in the realm of for-profit vendors, particularly those who do background checks for uh, employment and credit, they all call my office, my public information office, asking for the criminal history data that is public record, but giving a whole list of names and they haven't necessarily researched them to see if they've ever been in prison in Wyoming or not. So my staff have to go through that list and then determine of those who's been in prison in Wyoming at any point, and it's not limited to just the active cases, the ones that are currently on probation or parole and the ones that are currently incarcerated. So, so it's a fairly detailed review that ties, ties up staff time. And the third is those kind of national data requests that are, are uh, you know, somebody in search of information that's not necessarily just limited to, to Wyoming, but looking for a, a reason. Now, the way that we've set this, this up is that we mine those requests out to the to the individual institutions or wherever to gather that data, but ultimately it comes back through our designee, who's Deputy Director Lindley. And at current time, as we've kind of focused that effort in terms of redaction, for example, uh, Mr. Lindley's spending about 10% of his work week dealing with public records requests, which at a Deputy Director level is fairly significant. So uh, <clears throat> most of the requests that we receive, like other agencies, isn't burdensome. Uh, but uh, based on the previous testimony and suggestions, there are three areas that I, that I would think could be explored to make it a little less burdensome on the agencies, and that's to have a burdensome out. In other words, uh, as the Chief Deputy AG suggested, having some language that, that gives us the opportunity to, to go either to to the ombudsman or district court, uh, if we think something is is unduly burdensome or would be to give us the opportunity to immediately go to that source to present our case and and, prob and possibly 
uh, not have to do the research necessary to get to the, the cost estimate or the time estimate, because uh, just gathering that information is sometimes uh, burdensome. And the other would be, uh, although I've heard the, the term deep pockets for the state mentioned several times, I would disagree from an agency perspective that we have deep pockets. So we don't have the ability to necessarily spend $11,000 to to have uh, you know, a, a vendor provide us with a research tool. But certainly, uh, I would think that if there was a uh, funded depository uh, for the state where the state has provided this public information that it could be deposited so anybody could go to the to the centralized website and say this information is already there and then so we don't have to do it multiple times so that's my only comments madam chairman i stand for questions thank you director lampert i appreciate your solutions to some of these issues thank you. any comments from the committee thank you thank mr illoway Madam Chair, I'd like to get Craig Haslam to talk about the question. Wonderful. Mr. Haslam. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Craig. Madam Chair. Welcome. I'm Craig Haslam. I'm with the Wyoming Association of Special Districts. My, my real job is I'm the Fire Chief for Fremont County Fire Protection District, also somewhat representing the Wyoming Fire Chiefs Association. Um, the Senate File 57 for us was a compromise that uh, the original legislation was kind of a scare lot of us. It was very scary. Um, 13 to 15 groups came together, decided this is what we wanted to do, and it was, again, it was a band-aid for what we would look, hopefully look forward to for, for legislation that would come out to help everybody. Um, a little bit of history, if I, if I may, and I'll try to keep it really short. 2000, I believe it was in 2016, there was a committee put together about special districts, about open records, that, those types of things. In that committee, one of the things that they came out with was there needed to be some time with it and some education. Okay? And I, I agree, some of the special districts out there, we've had some problems in the past. There were things that were going on that weren't, weren't happening like they were supposed to be happening. And with hopes of being able to get the education out there in some time, we'd be able to get people up to speed on this, on, on what needed to be done, the things that need to be put out there, to help educate them, to put a process in place. And those are things that the Wyoming Association of Special Districts is currently working on, trying to get a training program out there so everybody understands what they need to do. A lot of the requests that we have seen in the past were requests from out-of-state agencies. Some of the people, I mean, to realize that You've listened from the top, the DEQ people who have been getting all these requests, but I'm talking about the small ones now. I mean, we have a lot of special or fire districts out there who their annual budget is less than 30000 some are even less than $12,000 a year, and that's what they need to keep going forward. Their boards are volunteers, strictly volunteer people who are doing this, and, and the requests they receive may go into somebody's email, that, or they may not even have email, or they're going to someone going somewhere and if they do have email they may have been ended up in their spam that was some of the concerns and in today's world where we're seeing a lot of things where people are trying to con people out of money out of things trying to get information from them and stuff a lot of people see that and go hey i don't have to answer that this is some place out of florida um arkansas wherever they were coming from they did not answer to those and again it's, it's a lot of these small boards weren't even getting that information and it's one of the requests that my district had, and we're one of the largest <coughs> districts in the state, was they wanted it in their specific format, and there, it had to be specific to everything they wanted, or we were non-compliant. So some of the information that was provided wasn't exactly correct. Yeah, it, it was correct, but it wasn't necessarily true in what it was trying to represent. Um, so we have a lot of concerns with those type of requests that were out there. And I agree 100% that we have to be transparent to our constituents. Okay? If anybody in my district wants to know what we're spending their money on, I owe them 100% of my time to prove to them and show them what we're doing with their money is what they have given us that money to do. And, and, and I agree that that should happen throughout our state. If we have people in the state of Wyoming that want to know what we're spending our money on, it is their, their right to know what we're spending their money on. Um, the concern comes is when we're getting these burdensome, even bullying types of requests from people saying, well, you got to reflect that. You got, you've got to give us this information because now it's in state statute. 
Senate File 57, again to us, was a compromise, hoping that we would be able to progress forward with the legislation that would come forward to help with not only, again, as the Attorney General spoke about, that we're, we're doing the right things for the right reasons. We're giving that information, but we're not being burdensome to, our, to the people that we're representing. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get through this quickly for you. Um, just some different thoughts that I had. And, and back on the surveys, I think there was still a lot of concern and confusion on the surveys that went out there. And, and I think there was some good representation in there, but I think there were some of the smaller entities that weren't represented, again, that weren't quite sure what was going on with that. Um, that's one of the things we're also working with with the Special Districts Association, trying to make sure people know and understand that we that there are certain rules and regulations we have to follow and help them to understand what needs to be brought forth for our public. Thank you. Any questions? Representative Salazar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I, this is the area that I've been concerned about is the, is the small districts. And um, what, what ideas do you have that, we, that possibly could help you um, in this regard? Mr. Haslam. Madam Chair, um, Representative Salazar. I think we're headed in a, in a good direction by with, with some of the information being available to our to our constituents at our local offices. But one of the concerns is our smaller districts that are out there, and it's not just the small districts, it's also the small communities, small towns, um, those, those types of areas. They're only open a certain amount of time. And that, and that with, I'm afraid, part of this current legislation is, could put a lot of burden on our uh, county clerks, because they are actually the depository for those records, and they're the ones that are responsible for them. And how that's going to work out is still a big concern, I think, for, as our as the representative from the county commissioner spoke about. There's some concern from them. Some of those county clerks are saying, nah, there's no way I want anything to do with this. So who's going to become their point of contact for that? Representative Stitt. Uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Aslan, isn't it true under current statute there's a special provision for documents related to just to, say, for example, special improvement districts? For example, special improvement districts can make the county clerk their designated depository. And then it's truly not the special district problem anymore. I mean, and if you've got bankers boxes of documents in the basement of the county courthouse and someone from St. Petersburg, Florida asks for them, I think the county clerk is perfectly entitled to say, you know, come to Dubois and look at them or Lander. Uh, I don't think there's, uh, I mean, I guess I'm, and it seems to me, so it would also be the case that special districts have, don't have hundreds of thousands of emails or don't have millions of documents. It just seems like it should be a more manageable process and to the extent that someone from out of state is asking you to compile it in a certain format. It seems that current law lets you say, you can tell them to pound sand and say, look, we're not going to go, we're not going to spend our time creating a new document for you. We'll give you what we've got. But so I guess I'm not seeing, I mean, I understand, I guess I've experienced the other, the other side of the situation where, I've asked for documents from special improvement districts, for example, and the chairman of the board has gotten together, you know, with his spouse in their living room. And they've decided which documents they thought they should destroy before producing the documents. So I've kind of been on the other side of that issue. So I just don't, you know, I guess my, I, don't, I don't see why special districts are in a worse position than, say, other state agencies. Mr. Haslin. Madam Chair, Representative Steele, I, I agree with you to a point, 100% there. But that puts that burden back on the county clerk. And I agree, that takes some of them out of the equation. But that's, I believe, only to those districts that are, I'm trying to remember the, the dollar alignment in there. But that is only to a certain point. If, if you have a certain dollar amount or you're, uh, sorry, I'm going back to the audits. But anyway, if you're open more than 20 hours, uh, 20 hours a week, like my district is, we would have to comply with that, any type of request that they gave. And one of the requests, as I stated earlier, one of the requests we received, they wanted it in a specific format and everything else. And I believe my office manager got together a quote and said, this is probably about what it's going to cost you. It could cost more. And they, at that time, did back down. But it doesn't necessarily take it away from all small districts. It takes it away from the really small ones, possibly. Possibly. And I'm not sure how that would work out, going with our ombudsman or the, the court, depending upon which one or the person after the record wanted to go, or maybe they'd go to both ombud, ombudsman, ombudsman or the, the court. They could go either way with this with this legislation. 
Any question for the special district? Madam Chair, we welcome people to Du Bois. So. Thank you, Representative Salazar. Fremont County is a lovely place. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any other agencies, entities would like to come forward? Welcome. Madam Chairman, Keith Kennedy for the Wyoming Association of Conservation Districts. And I would just like to emphasize what we have heard already about the, for lack of a better term, the dual appeal process that's available. And uh, that concerns me because uh, in the midst of trying to produce a, a, a public record, uh, that same person may need to be dealing with ombudsman, they also need to be dealing with a hearing in district court and consulting their attorney. And I think uh, a natural progression would make sense here, as well as the idea that you heard earlier of the availability of the ombudsman to the agency or entity that is expected to respond uh, with those large cases or in cases where there may be a large amount of of data that needs to be redacted because it's confidential business information, for example. And uh, with that, there's really nothing else that we have that you haven't heard already in the hours late. I'd welcome your questions. Questions? Thank you. Committee, how are you doing? Do you need to get up and walk around? You're, 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 you're lulling yourselves into, <laughs> into the evening. <laughs> All right, any additional agencies? Public comment? Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, my name is Amy Hendrickson. I'm with the Wyoming Association of County Predatory Animal Boards. Um, the, uh, I, the, most of what the concerns that have been um, uh, stated, I, we agree with. Uh, the only thing that I, I would like to mention, um, the, the question that was raised earlier about whether the county um, clerk can be the designated records person, the question that our um, uh, predator boards have is how do they name a, a person in another agency, another place to be their um, records person? You could request, but if they say no, that's where the information is. And then also the other point is that some of the information is split. So you have maybe your minutes and uh, th you know things like that there, your agendas and, and all there, uh, your budgets and everything. But you would have your financial stuff in house. And we have um, most, uh, in most cases, if they have a bookkeeper, it's a part-time person has a full-time job. And um, so there's some concern about being able to comply. That being said, they haven't had a lot of requests uh, at this point. Um, but if it is seen as a way to perhaps shut down a predator board's activities, that could become, a, um, if it seems that that might be an avenue to do that, that could be quite a problem for our um, for our board. So I just bring those to your attention. Yeah, you know, we're concerned about like one of the things that was said today about the ombudsman being only for the applicant is a real concern for us because we think um, having a consistent and standardized um, uh, method for, uh, for, uh, you know, re complying with records requests. Um, no, and training uh, our boards on what, how to comply with the records request, um, the Public Records Act and other things is very important. And what we find is that sometimes county attorneys don't necessarily agree either with each other. So one county attorney says, oh, do it this way. And another county attorney says, do it another way. And then sometimes that's different than what the AG's office would say. And, uh, and most of our boards do not have in-house attorneys, so. Lawyers never disagree with each other. <laughs> so, with that, um, I'll just take any questions if there are any. Thank you for being here. Any questions? Had you had you considered the predator boards? 
when it came to the Public Records Act Committee. Didn't cross your mind. Glad that you're here. Thank you. Valuable insight. Thank you. Any other agencies, entities? Should I count to three? I know there's some of you in the room that like to come forward. All right. Public comment is closed. Would the press like to come forward? Any other public comment? I do think that there is a member of the task force on transparency here. Please stand. <laughs> come on up. My name is Kristen Saban. I'm the president of the WPA board, as well as a member of the governor's transparency uh, task force. Do you want to um, update the committee on what the governor's task force has done, what the mission is, what they hope to accomplish, and how that might interweave with the committee's work? Sure, I can give you that perspective, um, my perspective on that. Uh, the meeting tomorrow will be much more informative than my testimony would be today. Um, but my understanding is, and where it sounds like they're heading, is looking at a couple of other states and how they make particularly financial data available. Um, they're looking at essentially trying to put the state's checkbook online for expenses. And again, focusing on expenses right now, not uh, revenues. Any questions for this member of the press and the task force with her dual hats? Thank you for being here. Sure. CZA. B A N. Representative Burlingame. Uh, Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just a quick question. Um, do we know? I, we at the Efficiency Commission. We heard from the State Auditor about the launch of that. And I'm just trying to. Wh when is that going to be launched? I thought it was in July or August. I think that's the timeline they're looking at. But they'll be doing a presentation tomorrow at the transparency meeting. So I think we'll have more details then. I do think um, for our next meeting. For this committee, um, we will invite a member of that task force to show us some of the work that they've done regarding that website um, and how it can work in with some of the concerns we've identified here. So any additional questions for um, Saban? Saban. <laughs> I can spell it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Public comments closed. Okay, committee. Any discussion, thoughts about next steps? So, committee, I will just start off with, if we look at our um, memo provided by LSO, kind of a compilation of the survey done from 177 government entities, as now the term is defined by Senate File 57, page eight, there were two on the last, on the first column, last paragraph on page eight, the top three challenges expressed by most were staff time or lack of staff. I'm not sure that we can necessarily solve that in legislation, but the second was difficulty understanding what could be disclosed or what documents were required for redaction. So I think one of the next steps for the committee is to look at the exceptions and those confidentiality requirements as indicated by the chief deputy and looking at those um, statutory definitions and see if we can't provide clarity with input from all of the government entities that question whether or not their documents are subject to those exceptions and if they question what should be added to that or what needs to be removed, what doesn't make sense anymore. So I would suggest that for our next meeting as an item of review and request all the the folks in the audience today to participate in that conversation. Three, the statutory timelines was a third thing that was identified. That was um, in current law, and now obviously we've heard from many of the agencies today that that continues to be a primary concern, particularly as it relates to the um, Senate File 57 and that 30-day deadline. I think the other um, compilation of information we heard was being able to for the state or government entities to access the avenues of appeal um, and identifying potentially in statute what would be determined unduly burdensome. Perhaps look at the Illinois law that the chief deputy identified um, as a means of accessing the ombudsman and or the court system. The, 
The term immediately in Senate File 57 probably needs further clarification to avoid future litigation. A policy question for this committee, I think, to consider is the compilation of data or not. Um, so I think in going to Representative Gray's question, what we've heard from the entities who testified today, that the reason I think probably why there's the low scores from the national groups is as a result of the data not being provided in a format that they want. And instead, it's just being provided. Um, and so a conversation about, about that issue of whether or not the data should be provided in a format that the requester demands or not. Policy question for the committee to consider is the, the purpose question about the purpose of the public records request. Because it's a, very difficult to manage. I think it becomes very dangerous when it comes to transparency issues. But, but one that I think Representative Burlingame has hit on, hit the nail on the head that needs to be addressed, recognizing that the agencies are experiencing, I think, what could be labeled potentially disingenuous requests from national commercial proprietary entities just seeking data um, for their own business opportunities as opposed to genuine need for transparency to the public of what is our government doing and, and that type of information. And should that be delineated or not? But certainly that is what our agencies are struggling with about whether or not there's a public policy exception regarding that disclosure. I think in going to Representative Washett's idea about kind of a central repository, and we've heard that theme somewhat throughout, I'm looking at um, a Attorney Fuller's memo to us that we just received this afternoon about the identification of all of the different state agencies and then municipalities, special districts, and when their budgeting requirements were, were done. The reason why I asked for this to be produced was for the possibility to consider requiring all of the government entities as defined by the Public Records Act um, to submit their financial data, their budget information on what is already required by the state um, under a and &I. So a and is required to administer the Wyoming Public Finance and Expenditure of Funds website. They currently do that. What I fear is happening in the state is a duplication of this major mission that's already been identified in statute, but really reinforcing that particular website and consolidating all of our state's information there um, into one clearinghouse that A&I is already managing um, and just redirecting some of all of these statutory provisions that we can see here in this June 3rd memo um, into, that, into that one repository as a way to alleviate public records requests associated with some of this financial requests. So there's a lot of information to take in, but I wanted to make sure that it, that it got out. Any response, Representative Washett, you have the microphone. Thank you, Madam Chair. One thing I don't think I heard you mention um, was something that, that alarmed me a little bit, and that is these requests coming in just via general email. And we were all given training about being protective of fishing expeditions and so forth. It seems we need some type of request template or process so that uh, a public record request stands out from daily email that might end up in your spam folder or you may not recognize and you just hit the delete button and suddenly you're non-compliant on a request. We need something more than just accepting requests via email. Great, great thought, Representative Washington. Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, Chairman, uh, I, I guess I just disagree. I don't think we should reinvent the wheel. For example, the first item that the Chairman mentioned was a review of every category of confidentiality. I think that's just too big a topic for us. I don't think it's a good use of our time to ask LSO to determine whether trade secrets should be trade secrets, whether they, we have, we have a laundry list of at least 30 separate item areas of confidentiality. I don't see any public policy reason. I don't think it's not just not good use of our time to revisit all of those. Uh, the law, we just changed the law this last session, Senate file 57. And people may not like Senate File 57, but it's going to go into effect on July 1st. It seems instead of, of having a, a big production to rework it, 
already. Uh, I just think it's it's the things outlined just now seem seemed overly broad and unduly burdensome for this committee to do or for the LSO to be tasked with. What does make sense to me would be to look at really narrow issues of should there be an undue burden exception of some kind uh, for the agency and should the issue of data mining uh, be addressed in some way. Those two things make sense to me. Uh, the, the, the 30 calendar day timeline the agencies seem not to like that, but they don't even know if it's a burden yet because, frankly, Senate File 57 gives them an automatic out. They just send a letter saying, we want more time, and then the ball is in the requester's court to deal with it. So I think that system will probably work. So I, I think if we're going to tell LSO to prepare some sort of draft idea, I think we should be focused on just one or two things that are the real problems that we can all agree on are real problems. Any additional comments from the committee? Senator Von Flater. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in response to uh, what Representative Stiss said, I really think we should be able to amend that bill and take Senate file 57, I believe it is, and just amend it to the ideas that you brought up and um, what the agency and the other um, entities have given us today. And so I am fine with just tasking LSO to make amendments in that bill, and then we can discuss it a little further. And, and thank you, Senator Von Fleider. To provide clarity to the exceptions, the direction to LSO is not to provide a legal analysis on every one of the 22 exceptions as found in statute. It's to review that statutory section um, in consultation with the agencies, and can we provide additional clarity as they have, 177 of them have identified it as their number two challenge in responding to public records requests. Is, is this an exception or not? And so hearing from them as we review that particular statutory section, which has nothing to do with Senate File 57, it's a totally different thing, um, to see if those terms and those, I, those subjects listed in there need further definition or removed or added. That's all that it is. It's not LSO providing a legal definition in, on trade secrets. Representative Ponell. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, you know, after listening to testimony today, and of course I was not a fan of the bill to begin with, but there's a thought, uh, it was a real simple fix would be repealing the bill. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. One thing I think is very important to clarify here is this 30-day provision. And I really direct people to page eight of, of Mr. Fuller's memo, which is that if 30 calendar days have passed and an agency doesn't think that that's reasonable, then they can try to come up with a mutually agreed date. And if they can't do that, then the person requesting the data appeals to the ombudsman. Now, that doesn't mean the state agency isn't their side isn't being heard. The point of that is just that their side is being heard by them saying we can't meet this, okay? And then the appeal is, it just says it should come from the requester. So, I mean, I think we're kind of, I don't know, I, I just don't see an issue with that. It's just saying that the appeal is going to come from the requester, but it's precipitated by the fact that the agency doesn't think they can meet the deadline and they're going to get their side when both sides are presented to the ombudsman. So, I mean, I'm just a little confused. I, I think the timeline is 30 days, but there's the opportunity for that to go then to the ombudsman. And I, I just, I don't think that quite came out on the 30 day. And I'm not quite sure what the concerns are on that. Representative Gray, I think the concern is that if the agency is unable to produce the record as required by statute within 30 days, and the requester does not agree to an extension, is the agency then in violation of the Public Records Act. Madam yes, Chairman, that would be that would be the Madam conclusion. I, 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 the way the memo lays it out, my memory of the bill is I'm, I'm not. The, the question is, the agency is going to say that there's good cause for them not to meet it, and then it goes to the ombudsman to decide if there's good cause. Now, if the ombudsman says no, there isn't, then they're going to set out a terms of how to meet it, and if they don't meet it, then then they're in violation. Okay. And that, and that, and that's. We wanted to then have a provision to say if they're in violation, then then it goes to district court. We couldn't get that in there. 
I think it would go anyway, but um, that that was the, I just think we're kind of searching. I, I, I don't think there's an issue with that. Now, what I would like us to, to look at, and this is probably going into more corporations and but getting accurate financial data and how, when we have these groups request blanket financial data, which is so important, it is very important in, in increasing confidence from the public and making sure there's not double dipping, to have full transparency on the financial data. How do we make sure that across the board we can get uh, as good compliance with that as possible in terms of the number of days that would pass before meeting and making sure that data is compliant, is, is accurate. And that's, that's the number one thing I think that I'm interested in on this, on this topic. And I'm so sure. what would you like us to do, Representative Gray, regarding that? What's your, what's I your think action your testimony, item? bring in Mr. Anjeski, some of the groups that are, are that Mr. Anjeski from OpenTheBooks.com, um, some of the groups that are seeking out the financial data, posting it all online, and saying what we need to do, maybe where we're deficient, because some entities of the state are still not responding to those requests, I think. Yeah. So, Representative Salazar? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think one of the ideas that you brought forward, Madam Chair, is something that I could definitely support, which is bringing these financials onto the website. It alleviates, my concern is for the smaller entities who have um, a lesser budget. If we, were to able, if we were able to put those financials on the website, it alleviates a lot of problems. And I, I think that's a good idea. And uh, I hope we go forward with that. Thank you, Representative Salazar. Any additional comments? Representative Jennings. Just kind of feeling kind of left out. So I just wanted to kind of speak a little bit. Uh, it's good to hear your voice, Representative Jennings. I, uh, Madam Chair, I, I don't know in my tenure that I've seen us pass a bill that has not been put into effect. And I've heard all kinds of great ideas here today. But as of July 2nd, um, some of those ideas may shift and may change. And uh, some of them you guys may want to implement prior to or, or thereupon it becoming law. And so I guess I'm feeling the, the uh, weird statement from earlier today that uh, typically government is not proactive. And so I guess I could commend that part of it, but it seems very strange that we're uh, that we're very fixated on fixing a problem in a bill that hasn't become law. And it just seems, uh, it seems premature to me, or weird. Maybe I'll just stick with weird, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative, or Senator Von Flater. My, my only, what got me was the, um, the request could be lost in the spam file. And so that in itself needs to be fixed to say that they need to have a uh, confirming email back that it, they did receive it. So that alone could take a fix and amend an amendment in this bill. And so with that, I think we need the bill and we need some amendments written by LSO. All right. All those in favor of, I move my requested topics to move forward into the interim, including Representative Washitz. So is there a second? I'll All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Motion passes. All right. The topic is closed. Six o'clock. We're getting through it. Other business. All right. There's no. Yeah. I think we will do um, other business. We'll do a quick review and directions to staff to make sure the committee's on board with direction to LSO. It's almost over, everyone. It's almost over. Madam Chairman, I, uh, I'll go over what I have from today, if that's all right. 
Um, I, I believe we have five, although I think we may need clarity on the last one. Um, I believe we have five uh, filled drafts um, from today that are for a total of 10. I uh, draft the abstract bill as requested by the Supreme Court administration. Draft the GAL bill, uh, making that an independent agency. Draft uh, the parent council bill. Uh, draft the tri trespass uh, strict liability bill as requested um, Mr. McGagna with uh, additional affirmative defenses from as appropriate from the uh, criminal entry statute. And my understanding, and I'll turn it over to Brian um, to discuss this since he'll be working on this, but draft amendments to Senate File 57 as noted. And Madam Chairman, I've got a laundry list of things that was discussed. Um, in terms of a burdensome exception, um, whether the exceptions that are currently in 64203D need to be clarified. Uh, and Madam Chairman, I think that's the piece that um, I lack direction on in terms of you know our process as LSO to decide, I guess, what goes in that bill draft. I, I think that's it's not a bill draft it's just work for the committee to consider so we're going to have so what i envision in our notebooks we'll have a copy of that statutory section available for us to review and look at um for just just to review the terms that are defined in there i hope to hear from we'll invite the some of the entities we've heard from today um, potentially some information from our survey information as well those entities that identified that as being a challenge for them in complying with requests to hear their testimony as to which particular terms they struggle with uh, for the committee to determine if it needs to be changed or not. So just a working item, no bill draft. So Madam Chairman, just to be clear, no bill draft, just work product regarding all of the items that you discussed and, and the items that Representative Washington and, and others have, have highlighted. So on that topic of the exceptions, so, so our, we're just going to have a copy of the statute in front of us, hope to hear solid feedback from government entities about the challenges that they experience or the public and the public, and then make recommendations accordingly, if any. That's it. So all you have to do is print the statute, <laughs> maybe invite some folks. It's not that complicated. And then also, just to make sure to follow up, important is using your memo that you provided to us today is to direct all of those that aren't, all the government entities that are, aren't already directed to provide their budget and financial information to a and I. That would be a bill draft. Representative Gray. Madam Chairman, I'd really ask that when, the, as the chairs consider the next meeting, how we're going to look at this uh, on the public records, that they consider bringing in OpenTheBooks.com. I, I, I have, you know, I can help. I know the people over there that have some experience with other states, how they handle the confidential information, just because. So we have a little bit of that experience as well. All right. Any additional comments from the committee? All right, our next meeting will be August 15th through 16th, 2019. Committee, thank you for your hard work today. We did some incredible lifting, and only the number one committee could have pulled off today. Congratulations. Thanks for your hard work. Drive safely home. <laughs> now for Committee 99.